If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Here America's first. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Sending out good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Good vibes. Blah, blah, blah. Good vibes. Good vibes. Good vibes. I need breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. America. You know, maybe only eight to ten thousand people. You know, would be the actual fully read in, working in space every day, you know, you know, bona fide members of. Secret means simply just classified. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. Uh, we're going to be chatting with the one and only Walter Bosley a little bit later. Secret space programs. Bosley. You son of a bitch. Don't ever interrupt me again. <laughs> We're going to be chatting with Walter Bosley a little bit later about the secret space program and breakaway civilizations and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, but first, as always, the great interrupter himself, Graham Old School Skunk Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? Hey, buddy. Okay, how you doing? Good. Yeah. Good. Pretty good. This yeah. was a fun interview with Walter. Yeah, it was awesome. Despite all the fucking problems we had oh that's right took us an hour to get oh connected. that's right yes yeah it's funny to hear a guy like that even say like now i understand why people say you know yeah we tried fucking, skype fucking, for a half an hour then we tried zoom for a half an hour yeah and then we ended up calling his phone and then you even had recording problems which was weird on your yeah on your system i haven't even tried to edit this shit yet so this could be a total fucking train wreck I think it'll be okay, though. Yeah. We have a pretty good system in place. And we're kind of pushing it out as extra content, that we're going to put out an extra episode this uh, this month. This Yeah, this month, I guess. This month, yeah. yeah. We're going to sneak this one out and pop out another one on Saturday or something. So, yeah. Uh, you're welcome. Enjoy. Uh, so, what's new, buddy? Oh, not much. Just, you know... <laughs> Just Not get want to get this uh, winter over with. Let's no just fucking drag it shit. On a little it bit snowed long. a fucking foot on Friday. It was minus twenty. It snowed a foot. Yeah, and it's March it just now. Wouldn't just stop. sometimes March gets warm, and you're kind of like, okay, we're going into spring, but we're not there yet. I it's made just, an, I made a Quonset though, or what do they call the Quincy, where you pile up the snow and then dig it out. It's an igloo. No, an igloo's with bricks. There's a difference. Snow bricks? Like yeah, snow bricks? I think there's a difference. No, you didn't make a... Maybe it is an igloo. We just dug it out, though. We made a big pile of snow, packed it down. And then dug it out. And dug it out. I was actually going to get you to go in there tonight for a little photo shoot, but I forgot. It's a good thing. It's a little dark and cold right now. <laughs> yeah. What would I have to do with the summer still up? Yeah, we made it. It was little... pretty small. I don't know if I'd fit in there. I fit in there. Oh, I can fit in there and turn around and come out. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's way bigger than it looks. It's crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of snow there because it's because the base snow is like fucking two feet deep. So yeah. the thing like extends into, it's like an underground base. Yeah. Own little American nice. underground base. Any breakaway civilization. <laughs> you could go in there and have your own little breakaway <laughs> civilization. Eat some Kit Kats. There you go. Be good. It's my birthday this weekend too. This episode's oh, coming uh, out of my birthday. Is that? Oh, yeah. oh no, this is a bonus app. Never mind. Happy early birthday. Never mind. The next step, I, I think the next step I'm actually going to release on my birthday. Nice. Happy early birthday. 35? Fuck, I wish. Are you? 34? Huh. 37. You were just 33. What are you talking about? Yeah, four years ago. We've been doing the show. Holy <laughs> shit. Really? Remember you fucking sent into no agenda for my 33rd birthday. That was fucking four years oh ago. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. That was right when we started listening to the podcast, time to No traveling. Agenda, which time was like, traveling. and we started listening to No Agenda just a couple months into making this podcast. We found out about it when we yeah. went on the Nat Marie show. Yeah. And then you surprised me for my Which 33rd. got shut down right, right after we went <laughs> Right after our episode. I don't think it even got released. End of it. End of the podcast. Like but a, Buddy had turned us on to No Agenda. Yeah. And I searched for it years ago, though, and I didn't find yeah. it. You know why? Because it probably wasn't in iTunes. Probably. They have their own they deal, and it was back before I was using a third-party app. 
Anyways, enough reminiscing about time flying by in the igloo. It, we do say time is fucking different in the igloo, but yeah. this is crazy. Four years. Yeah. Four years ago. So I was thinking maybe two years, like 35 yeah. and you're 37. So are you only four years? You're only 10 years younger than me then. Yes. I thought it was 11. It will be 11, I guess. It will be 11 in a couple of months. And then it'll yeah. be 11 for most of the time. Yeah. More time. It spends more time 11 than it does 10. Yeah. That's good. We span a couple, uh, couple generations. generations yeah. Yeah, good X, and, X, X, X and Y. Yeah. I'm like a X-lenium. <laughs> You're supposed to be Y. Am I? Yeah, then they got rid of Y for some reason. They just turned into millennium. It's easier, uh, to, I don't, easier to categorize well, I found that weird cusp, though. Are you on the second millennium cusp or the first millennium cusp? The first cusp? millennium yeah? cusp. No. Yeah. I thought I was on the cusp of X. You aren't on the cusp of fucking anything. Maybe X. I don't know. I don't have the Google machine hooked up right now to ask it either. That's good. I forget what we were talking about last time and I didn't want it to hear. Really? Yeah. It was probably Walter Bosley's episode. Oh, it might have been, yeah. Maybe that's why they fucking shut us down. Because I unplugged the Google. Yeah. They're like, no, if we can't listen, you motherfuckers aren't podcasting. <laughs> huh. I had it. Did you take my clip cord, you son of a bitch? Or is uh, this nope. it? Nope. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah, so that could be the reason why. That's right. Google was down in the studio, and they didn't want us to record. Oh, uh, you know what? Do you have anything you got to get to? Do you have anything pressing? No, I got lots of stuff, but nothing pressing. Nothing pressing? I'm going to go right away to the... uh... I got some feedback on this jingle for you. We need a poll result. We need a poll jingle. Because I've been having fun with the polls lately Because now we're getting some real turnout on them So when you can get a few hundred results You can actually start to get something tangible You know what I mean? As opposed to 50 or 60 So this week's poll question Do you listen to the intros or do you skip them? Oh, Don't forget there is always a chapter mark And a time stamp to the start of the interview I listened to the intros, came in at 56%. I skipped the intros, came in at 25%. And What's a Podcast came in at 19%. That's awesome. Yeah, so we got some comments here. Hey, for real, guys, forget about the twats who complain about the awesome ramblings at the start. Why is this even a thing? Fuck those guys. I really love the intros from the Great White North. There's a couple Bob and Doug references. Without the intro, it's just another interview podcast, and there's plenty of those. Oh, cool. Indeed. We I, don't care. We don't really care, because we're going to no. do them anyways. So yeah, we're not stopping. Don't... It was never, we were never going to stop the intros. It was just a, it's just a fun poll. Send us, send me your poll things, because I'm going to do a poll every week now for a little while, or every other week or something. Um, indeed, I prefer the intros. Half the time, they're the best part of the show. I skip commercials. This is from fucking Cyrus. Piece of shit. I skip commercials, but listen. Actually, I can't call him that anymore. He started supporting. Oh, okay. Yeah. I skip commercials, but listen to the intros. We come to Grimerica for Darren and Graham, and the guests are the cherry on top. Blah, blah, blah. Fuck you, fuckers. <laughs> Uh, I listen, but I find myself skipping the jingles often. I wonder if that's the same guy you got some feedback for. Honestly, I skip the interviews sometimes, but I also always listen to the intro. There should have been a f- fourth option. At first, I skipped a couple, but now it's fun. I listen all day at work. All right, good, good stuff. Thanks yeah. for doing that, Darren. Yeah, there it's good. Go. What's I got some comments from. Uh, uh, I want to do the. I, I thought about doing the Team Graham one, but I don't want to get Breakaway Civilization hammered. versus Secret Space Program. No, I can't. That would do be that. a week that, behind. That people won't. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, no, because then they'll they've listened to the show. Oh and, yeah. Uh, we'll think of something. What do you got? I got some feedback from Instagram. I could. Uh, oh, I can that keep fits continuing in the on with this okay. segment. This is from Fires in the Sky, and it was from our episode with. <clears throat> Lynn McTaggart, The Power of Eight. <laughs> Actually, Think Not had a problem posting 
for this episode. He couldn't get his thing posted. It's very interesting. He came through anyways, but I, I understand. I can't put CIA as a tag on this on Instagram. It won't uh, allow it. Really? Yeah. I don't believe that. That's the one I have to delete every time, and then it allows it to go through. <clears throat> so this is from Fires in the Sky. Dude's awesome show. Had a fun synchro with this one in the beginning of the podcast when Lynn first brought up that thoughts and prayers are patterns of energy. The split second before she said it, my eyes locked onto a sign while I was driving for a place called Energy Dance Club. So not only was the word a synchro, but the fact that dancing is energy in motion. Also, since you're awesome, Joseph Farrell app, I went on a podcast bender listening to anything and everything JPF I could find. I came across a bunch of them on YouTube account called uh, For- Forum Borealis. His absolutely mind-blowing interview is called Hidden Patterns of Creation. And he gets into mythology, math, proportions, music octaves, eight. Analogical learning, how metaphors transmit coded information, and how it all relates to consciousness. I got totally pinged when I realized why Lynn's group of eights were so effective. Conscious re- consciousness resonance based on the octave. Thought this particular podcast might be of interest to you. And if you guys set up the group thing on the chats, I'm definitely in. So there you have it. Definitely in. There you have it. I'll do a couple of YouTube. I, to- I got I got another oh, one here. Yeah, from, okay. Now think. <clears throat> I wonder if. Uh, okay, I'll read this. I haven't read it yet, so this is a first read. This is from Think Not. Great episode. And this is about Fiona Horn, the Naked Witch episode. Great episode, guys. Fiona has certainly had a varied and chaotic life. I was so pleased to hear how she got her stuff together and discovered one of life's most important lessons, compassion, kindness, and love. I hope Darren's wife felt much better. He could not have left the show in better hands. Graham was a consummate professional and kept the show interesting with his thoughtful and inquisitive line of questioning. The pre-show banter was really good and had me grinning from ear to ear. Darren's 6.8 synchro score was a bit mean, but if he didn't set the bar so high, the quality would suffer. Keep smashing it, gentlemen, and I look forward to the next podcast and your style of banter. It's about time you place copyright notice on it. Eight mushrooms out of ten. What mean? It's not my fault, bro. I don't remember what the synchro rating was for. I have no personal stake in the game. Here we got one on number 271. Well, you do, because if people donate, they seem to get higher synchro scores. So, Are you questioning my integrity, you son of a bitch? (laughs) (laughs) Been scanning old episodes, saw some info on earthquake tech. Just wondering if you've looked up Ben Davidson. Ah. He's one of the leading guys, in my opinion, doing peer-reviewed research on the subject. If you haven't, check out his YouTube channel, Suspicious Observer. And then you love linking to the RF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get a kick out of it. Ah, uh, here we got one I love. So hang on, but let's finish the thought. So Darren then linked to our previous episode with Ben Davidson. Yeah. it's uh, That's one of the, f- the best parts about this is when people say, hey, have you ever heard of this guy? And you like show him the episode that we yeah. already had him on. And we got... Uh, I love the intro rambles. It's not crap. It's never crap. I could not agree more with the feedback synchro at 2035. I second that notion. I wonder, oh, our podcast was the second that he ever came across and inspired him to start his own. Nice. You know what? If I press that little 2035 he wrote in there, it goes right to it. Do you think he had to do that? Or do you think... YouTube does it automatically if you write it. Down. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> that's not. Oh, that's ours. Yeah. Okay, that's a social media segment. What else you got? Uh, before I forget, we have an event in Calgary that we should oh, plug right. because Jamie Janover, who is our past guest he's one of yeah, Nassim the Nassim Harriman's um oh henchman no oh my god now <laughs> 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 I can't think of the, the, the word to describe it 
Anyways, spiritual masters, sages, yogis, and mystics have been telling us we are all one for thousands of years now. Science is explaining it and how and why of what they already know. And this is um, the unified theory field theory of Nassim Harriman and beyond. And this is Jamie Jano. We're putting it on. He's his we're emissary. Go, I think, He's right? his emissary, not his henchman. <laughs> Discover the science. I bet of... you, if you put emissary in the thesaurus, henchman comes no. up. No. Yeah, Discover okay. the science of oneness and the paradigm shifting half day workshop. So this is on April 29th, and it's at the Gray Eagle Resort and Casino. Like seriously, that will be a mind blowing. And we're gonna try and get uh, Jamie in the in the igloo for that. He said he's down. I think. Oh, sweet. Yeah, that'd be fun. We'll go to that thing too, I think, probably. <clears throat> oh, definitely. Might as well. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I got some listener emails. <laughs> that... <laughs> when I put emissary in there, hired gun came off. <laughs> <laughs> Henchman didn't, though. Okay. But hired gun, I think, is worse. I like deputy. So the other thing I want to, uh, I have is, uh, I'm going to play a little bit of the open minds podcast with Alejandro Rojas and Leslie Kane talking about the, the whole, uh, video and the, the government program studying UFOs and all that. You got a real ha- habit of playing podcasts on the podcast. You need the clip cord then? No, I just, I'll just push it up to the speaker. Okay. Do you want to do that now? Do you want to do this well, one by now? This, by the, yeah, do it now. Or do you want to go through some emails and or the UFO quote of the week? Let's start with that. <sighs> Check if... Let us know if Graham sounds different, too. This is, this is uh, Darren's favorite. It's from the CIA.gov reading room. It's not a quote. Declassified in part, sanitized copy for release in 2014. And this is a Worcester... Worcester sauce? (laughs) Worcester Gazette. (laughs) And it's Congressional Action. Ex-CIA chief wants UFO probe. And I believe the year of this article is... You know what? I don't know if I can see. Oh, June 1960. 1960. Jeez. And this is by Buck uh, Bulkley Griffin, the chief of Evening Gazette, Washington Bureau. And it says, uh, Admiral Hill and Cotter, who headed the CIA from 47 to 50, recently declared, speaking about the so-called flying saucers, the unknown objects are operating under intelligent control. It is imperative that we learn where the UFOs come from and what their purpose is. Then, referring to the years of World War II and the years immediately following, he said, I know that neither Russia nor this country had anything even approaching such high speeds and maneuvers. Here, Admiral Hillencotter presumably was speaking of at least part of the period during which he was director of the CIA. He wants congressional investigation of the UFOs. This is a proposal that others have made in recent years, and it has been consistently opposed by the Air Force which possesses exclusive official authority to investigate and report to the public upon the identified flying objects. So far, Congressional Committee has shied away from such a probe. Pardon the pun. Ah. The U-2 incident, with its attending circumstances, furnishes particular life and significance to the Hill and Cotter convictions. To begin with, the Admiral, for about three and a half years, held the same job that Alan Dulles now holds, and Hill and Cotter undoubtedly received reports to the UFOs, including the findings of investigations concerning them. Dulles, without question, has received reports and findings on the UFOs. By the way, in the early 1960s, the CIA rather openly helped arrange a Pentagon meeting of top scientists on the strange objects. The conference issued conclusions which, among other things, said the UFOs oppose no apparent threat to national security and recommend that the public be told more about them. This recommendation immediately died. No need to stress that when Hill and Cotter states the UFOs are intelligently controlled and were neither 
our inventions nor Russia inventions, he speaks with a knowledge possessed by few other citizens. Whether a former director of CIA keeps in some contact with the CIA and its information after he has left the agency, no one will probably answer. Lied by plan. But to come to the U2 matter, here was a case where we lied by prearrangement, lied by plan. In the light of the Air Force banning the UFO matter, insisting against plain evidence to the contrary in certain cases, that the UFOs can all be explained as familiar objects mistakenly identified. The question inevitably arises, is the Air Force following a prearranged plan of public statements on the strange objects? Is the Air Force deliberately misleading the public? Regarding our early lying about the captured U-2 plane and its pilot, our statement that the plane was an innocent weather plane, this statement was pushing a button which he stated he had been prepa- it had been prepared in advance. So Secretary of State Christian Herter said our statement was a cover story that was prepared for that contingency. And the Under Secretary of State Dillon repeated, used a, repeated, we used a cover story which had been previously prepared for such an instance. An all-important revelation for our citizens from the U-2 case is that high official policy to lie to our citizens and to the world in some cases. Mistaken identify, <clears throat> mistaken, mistaken identity. Do the UFO sightings constitute such a case? Let it be said, parenthetically, that the majority of the sightings obviously involve mistaken identity, but a small minority do not. These present evidence that the Air Force explanations are not true. Admiral Hillicotter, with all his special knowledge, says this. Says this indirectly, if you will. Does CIA Director Alan Dulles believe that something like national panic might be produced if the Air Force finally said that it can't just explain certain UFO sightings? Or has he been advised for some other reason that the Air Force line of conduct? Hmm. Has he been advised for some other reason the Air Force line of conduct? Former CIA Director Helen Cotter does not believe the Air Force is telling the citizens the truth about the unidentified flying objects. He would have a congressional investigation. His judgment is entitled to extraordinary attention. Was that a short story or like you got even got a little dramatic at the end there? Well, it's a fucking pretty important article. Article? Yeah. You read articles now? Yeah, dude. <laughs> This quote is it's getting an, out of control. It's, it's an appropriate one for tonight's you episode. You throw some quotes around it and it's a quote. <laughs> I'm running out of UFO quotes now. All right. Yeah, I got a few. We'll just change it to Ground's profound quote. <clears throat> what do you mean? Then you won't be stuck no, with UFOs. It's, no, it's, a U, it's about the UFOs. <laughs> but it's you could good. just be about everything. The show is about everything. It's all good, buddy. Okay, so what's up? What do you want to do? I want to do a synchro. Yeah? Yeah. I'm a listener. I don't know. Do you have one? I, I, I did, yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Actually, should I do the... I want a good score from a synchronicity. Graham reads it out, then Daryl might give it to me. Hey, don't you please read it low. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. I just lost it. Huh. I mean, okay, I got it. Keep talking. All right. Hey, Graham, this one's a little long-winded, and it has a few parts. On Monday, I went to a lodge. I'm a Freemason. I sometimes bring three growls of beer from my local beer brewery f- with me for everyone to have after, uh, during the dinner after the meeting. I got into a discussion with the cashier, whom I've never met before, about podcasts, and I mentioned Gramerica. As it's the fir- first podcast I chose to listen to in my life, and three years later, it's the only one I listen to. You guys are doing great things, and I appreciate it. Anyway, the cashier started describing a book, but couldn't remember the name. I guessed the book, Tools of Titans, from her clues, and because my sister gave it to me last Christmas. I had recently watched the YouTube video, The Power of Intentions, 
where our words and thoughts or perhaps vibrations can change the structure of water into beautiful microscopic icicles when frozen. Our bodies are 70% water, so that suggests we can change ourselves with our words or thoughts. On Wednesday after work, I visited my mom and was telling her about these experiment, experiments with our words and intentions, and I told her how I lost 25 pounds when I was 19 with daily affirmations into the mirror. I didn't tell her or too many people about my methods at that time. They since then, I told you to go for a walk. <laughs> since then, I had kind of lost the belief in it. It's been about eight years. After having my discussions with my mom, I went home. As my girlfriend and I spent the evening in the living room, I decided to read a book while she watched TV. Naturally, I picked Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. I opened randomly at page 263 and began reading the story of Scott Adams, the guy who drew the, the Dilbert comment. Comic? Comic. <laughs> It had a whole page dedicated to affirmations and suggested that if you write simple goal or affirmations 15 times a day on a piece of paper, that strange coincidences or synchronicities will happen. Crazy as I was just talking about changing things with words and thoughts. Then I texted my sister about the synchronicity and she said she was researching affirmations that afternoon. I'm going to give it a shot. I'll let you guys know how it works. Sorry for the long email. Take care, guys. Thomas. What a great email, eh? Is it a synchro, though? Oh, yeah. It's a huge synchro in there with the tools of Titans and the affirmations and the cashier and the sister. It's completely compound. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with a 6.5. Oh. Um, I like it, though. But And even the part that what what actually used to, when you started paying attention to affirmations is from Scott Adams. That's yes. what really got you onto it, which yeah. is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, technically, my wife's been telling me about him for a long time. <laughs> but, and then uh, it took Scott Adams to, <laughs> to really sink in. Well, I, you know, and the podcast and everything else, you know, you hear something so many times and you start to see things happen. Yeah, I'm going to start you it know, too. It starts to get hard to ignore. So then you try it, it and then you see results. So it's like... Guten Sie Fuken. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. You're going to try what? The weight, the weight thing. You're going to try and affirm losing weight? Yeah. Do it up. Yeah, I've been going back and forth with him. He kind of gave me a little bit more Do detail some on affirmation his technique. And... I'm losing weight yeah. while you're jogging. <laughs> and I guarantee you success. <laughs> Quit cramming, cramming those fucking Denvers. Eating in... Denvers? No, I don't have Denver. those What's Denver a Denver? sandwiches? I need the egg and the bacon and all that shit on That's there. not bad for you. It's the bread that's killer. It's yeah. the carbs. I and those think. eggs are guaranteed like the worst fucking eggs money can buy. What? What do you mean? Because they're not those free range eggs, or whatever? Those eggs are from a chicken that doesn't even know there's a sun. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, uh, I, the eggs I buy, I, I make a lot of eggs at home and the, I buy the free range ones. I get my, my eggs from the Truffaut Show. Do you? So he supports Gramerica. Don't, don't look for a link in the show notes. <laughs> You had the link too, motherfucker. <clears throat> I was Sorry, down with the Michael. notes in your <laughs> for a couple in. You were driving. Sorry, Michael. It'll be in this week's. The link for the Truffaut show will be in this week's show notes. The show yeah. notes for this show. Yeah. So thanks for the email, Thomas. And also awesome. the link for Andrew Jones' thing that wasn't in the last show. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, Last Journeys of Crygold Bird Devant. Yeah. The f High Fantasy Tales. Yeah. M A N D R E W Jones.com. Mandrew. Not Andrew. Mandrew. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a spot. Is any of the spin off into the support where we ask you guys to help us out by supporting the show? Um head over to grimerica.ca slash support to the new and improved support page where there is uh, now weekly, monthly, and yearly options. You can pick any of those. It'd be super, we'd be super happy about that, and it would help us pay the bills. It's been a fucking cold winter. Global warming is a bitch. Um, yeah, if you could do that, then it's also going to get, you can do a one-time donation too, and we do have Patreon now as well. <laughs> uh, that's patreon.com slash Grimerica. But if you go to the support page, um, there's a link there just as well. Did you mention the black budget? 
Yep. Because no. any any donation will get you access. Just to, it's basically like a like a thank you thing for all the all the supporters. Some extra content in there, a little bit yeah, crazier content, a little bit more controversial. It's probably t- twenty episodes in there. There's twenty episodes in there two, now. We got a couple two a month in there. Yeah, we've been doing two a month, kind of random stuff. We're gonna start actually. We're gonna start uh, doing some interviews with some other some past guests and things like that that we we can't squeeze into the regular feed. We're gonna start putting them in there. Uh, we got a couple coming on and coming up in March. We're gonna do one with uh, Sam and Ryan of the Tin Foil Hat. Um, Looking forward to that one. Yeah, that'll be a fun one. A and couple then more gonna, swapcast. Dude. Yeah, we're gonna do one with uh, Jordan Boner party too. Bonaparte Day from the Nighttime Podcast. Uh, we're gonna do a, a a black budget episode with him, and then I think in April we'll end up doing one with Greg from the Higher Side Chats and. And so all that stuff is going to start showing up in the black budget feed as well. Banal? Oh, oh Banal, Banal, the Banal is going on the swap cast for the regular feed. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right on. Uh, the, the swap cast for the, for the black budget feeds are with the people that also have oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, Patreon yeah. supporter yeah. stuff yeah. and yeah. things like that. So it's going into their yeah. stuff as well. And then we've also got some guests that we just, you know, we've got so many interviews lined up and so many, there's so many fucking possibilities that we just can't squeeze it all into the regular feed. And so some of these extra shows will just start going, um, throwing them in there too, just to throw some extra black budget content and maybe try and hit that 1% mark. Maybe 2018 is the year we hit 1% support. Yeah. I threw a couple other things on the new page as well as, uh, instructions for how to get the RSS feed to work. Uh, all the episodes are there. The upcoming schedule is there so you can email Graham. Uh, there's another link to all the media, the videos and stuff like that. And then there's also, I've added a page, which is crimerica.ca slash sample or BB sample. And that's just got... Budget sample. Yep. You pop on there and it's just a five minute, uh, five or six minute little blurb from each episode that's in there so far. If you want a quick sample. Right on. Thanks for doing that, buddy. That was a lot of work. Check that out and do sign up for a support option. If you can, it does really help. Right on. All right, buddy. Thanks for the little ramble. We also have, uh, Darren's on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Lots of good ways to get a hold of us on there. And uh, I've got a uh, story. A story? A UFO story from a listener. Oh, another story. And then I'm going to play like a couple minutes of a podcast for us to talk, just to tie into this. Uh, so we're going to do this chat a little bit with Walter Bosley and UFOs and government secrecy and cover ups and all that kind of stuff. I like it. I think I have the perfect jingle. Jingle. Okay. There we go. <laughs> we had the new moon, dark sky, which is great. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, uh let's uh, uh, shut it off. Lovely, lovely. Let's hear it. As soon as I start hearing my name and that, it creeps me out. <laughs> okay, this is from Daniel in Jacksonville, Florida. I've been listening to your show for a couple of weeks now. I'm loving it. Thanks to the Tinfoil Hat podcast. I was introduced to your podcast and I'm really excited to have found a really great show. My only minor complaint is the social media jingle that goes bing, bing, bingo, bango. Social media jangle. <laughs> it drives me up the fucking wall. I don't skip it though because I'm hoping I will end up loving it like the terrible Firefly intro music that I ended up loving by the end. Which Firefly? Our Firefly? No, the Firefly, the, the <laughs> cult uh, sci fi. I'm See, that's a, that's a, no, but that's, ca- it's, it's going to catch on. I hated it at first too. And now I like it. You think so? Newsletter, that whole part. I liked it. Nice. Yeah. Back to it. Anyways, the reason you're probably reading this, the UFO sighting, I just wanted to start by saying, I don't exactly think it was extraterrestrial, but from my limited experience, experience, it didn't look like anything I'd seen myself. 
living in Miami at the time. I was on my way to watch a friend's band play, and I was riding in her car on the way to the venue. On the way there, we were stopped at a red light, and I just so happened to look over to my right, and right there above the suburbs of Miami, there seemed to be a large blimp. It was about 9 p.m., so it was really dark out. It had lights running along the side of it, and it seemed to have a muffler of some sort, and it was just floating there, not moving at all, and it seemed to be a much lower altitude than any blimp I had seen before. I yelled at my friend, Stop the car, there's a UFO. I began to stick my head out the window and to gain attention of nearby vehicles and pointing out this anomaly. <coughs> I was so excited that I scared my friend to death. She wouldn't stop. She even had a really nice dslr camera camera so we would have been able to get a real nice shot but she refused to stop out of fear <laughs> we never turned back for it and i will forever wonder what it was should have turned back i wonder what that thing was till this day but unfortunately it's been so long my brain has just classified it as a nighttime blimp anyways i hope my story was interesting i also have an interesting lsd experience which i might share in a future email Please do. We take trip reports here as well. Absolutely. We thank do. you. Thank you so much for the excellent content. I'm looking forward to listening to more and more. Thanks again, Daniel. Actually, I have an email I'm going to read too from Taylor. Taylor B. Darren, you guys are amazing. I searched for podcasts like yours on Spotify and found you not but a week or two ago. Blew my mind. Topics like these always got skeptical of me. But then they just passed me by. But now I'm actually sitting down and understanding. Extremely credible of you guys to get such reliable, sometimes which makes half the fun, interviewees inciting actual government officials and such makes a more telling argument. Sidebar, I moved to Utah, USA three years ago, found out in last... Sorry, I just got an email, a notification that blocked it. Found out in last year or so about a place called Skinwalker Ranch, not but a couple hours from me. Ooh. Once owned by Robert Bigelow, a yeah. huge millionaire believer in UFOs. Anywho, it's just so interesting of a story to look up into if you haven't already. I'm sure you have because I haven't even skimmed your content yet. <laughs> UFOs, werewolves, floating lights, magnetic anomalies, supposed portholes, portals, all in one area, portholes on a boat. <laughs> I'm a bit bummed he sold the property and to who I don't know. Find them and bring them to me. I'll get the inside scoop. P.S. I'm still learning who's who, but I think it's you who has the stoner laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So anyway, yeah, I've read that. I wanted to read that email because you know what? That email was in response to the link for the Black Budget support feed that I had sent out. Oh, yeah. To Taylor, who had only been listening for two weeks. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. The other thing you sent out a link on, and we should probably just brush upon this. If you say, if PayPal, say, PayPal, <laughs> if pay, that's the stoner laugh right there. I was just trying Come to on. get the stoner yeah, laugh. Yeah, right. right. If PayPal says they canceled, that we asked uh, to cancel your subscription, we didn't. We don't. No, we never, we've never. So, yeah, it's if that happens, just, you know, you can re-sign up or whatever. Um because if you we, get an email from us that says we suspended your payments, it's a lie. Yeah, it's not true. So PayPal does weird shit like that. So just be careful of that. Keep an eye on it. If you so it's a good it. idea to double check your yeah. subscription from time to time and make sure PayPal hasn't canceled you. Yeah. They're always trying to cut us off at the knees over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have this, uh, I just want to play this. Uh, this is a really interesting summary. Is it of Alejandro? The whole, yeah. Is the audio any better? It's better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This just seems like a shame to play that audio through that great mic. Okay. Yeah. With uh, the uh, your story, there's a couple other important pieces that were in there. Oh, and I guess just to follow up on the last point real quick is yeah. that's why I think it's really important to have like you come on and talk about how this story came about. Because I think uh -huh. a lot of people think of, you know, these these cabal people like an X-Files sitting in a dark room at the New York Times um, coming up with a plan. We're going to write this story and that story. Who can we get to write it? And who can we get in the DOD oh, yeah. to be our guy to tell people this? You know, I think there's... You mean like it's some kind of orchestrated plan yeah. thing by some 
organization or entity that controls all the information, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I have never, ever encountered anything to give me even the smallest hint that that's what's going on mm -hmm. in my own work. And certainly not in this article with the New York Times. I mean, we, it happened the way I'm telling you it happened. Right. I got this information. We pitched it to the Times. They said, hey, yes, this is a story. Let's do it. It's that simple. Yeah, and that's the tragedy with uh, these conspiracy theories because then all of these people who are working with the mainstream uh, media or, you know, or, or production uh, organizations on television shows or movies or documentaries, you know, they're not giving credit that they're the ones who came up with this idea. I mean, it was you going to Blumenthal. It was you all. That's where the, what generated the this story and the situation, or at least this story, to get out. So people then, yeah, you know, it, it allows people to have these conspiracies where they're not giving credit where credit's due. I guess so. I, I don't know why they're so attached to that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there have been plenty of insiders over the years who know a lot more than is being revealed. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's what people are concerned about. A lot of the reason that a lot of stuff has not come out is simply be due to the fact that it's classified. It's mm -hmm. highly classified and protected in special access programs and so on. And people who know about these things would go to jail if they talked about it. Yeah. So it's, a, you know, they can't do it. And so you can't fault them. It doesn't mean there's some grand conspiracy behind it. It just means like so many other topics, certain things are kept secret for, for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, on this issue, I've learned a lot more about the, the role that um, – uh, concern for our adversaries uh, getting a hold of a lot of this information. But that plays a big role in the desire to protect it. And mm -hmm. that's legitimate. That's right. legitimate. So I don't know. I, I mean, I can understand that people are frustrated that more has not been released and that the government hasn't acknowledged a lot of things. But I don't think, you know, creating this, this, idea that there's some vast cabal conspiracy controlling it and they're like planning how they're going to let you know they're planning everything and they've set up to the stars because they're manipulating <laughs> tom DeLong to create this this thing and they're giving him certain information and then they're controlling the next step which is the new york times and then they're i just i've never seen that there's any force behind these things that are that are making them all happen mm-hmm Right. I just don't. That I don't could have know. just been your UFO quote. So, come on. So I was, you know, I mean, they sound very genuine, right? Leslie Keene's a great, you know, investigator. She's done really good work. And I respect Alejandro and what they do over there at Open Minds. And it's very convincing, right? There's nothing to it. And then I'm str I struggle because on the other side, I mean, they mentioned it a couple times. I don't get why people don't. Like, I don't know why people don't believe this and why the conspiracy. And I was like, well, you, you don't understand, like, that we don't trust the mainstream media anymore, including the New York times. And we don't trust the government and all these fucking secret programs that they have. I mean, do I have to go on and on and on about why that we're skeptical of this? You know? Yeah. She was, you know, in a meeting with these people and they provided her with this documentation and with this government program. And okay, this, uh, this Alessandro guy is going to come out with it. And then they pitch it to the New York Times and they come back a week later and say, yeah, it's a good story. Like, well, did that not go up the chain at all or anything like that? I mean, it's not just because Leslie hasn't been involved. And I, and I, and I believe her. I don't think she's lying. But just because she hasn't been Why don't we have her seen on it happen, just because she hasn't seen it happen, it doesn't mean that there has there's not somebody at least allowing that information out or pulling the strings or but why now why does the government want to release this now or why is it okay now for this guy to come out and talk about this it's just it's yeah i mean i wish it was real disclosure but it's just hard to not be skeptical about it why don't we get her on <laughs> yeah maybe yeah she wrote that awesome book, Generals, Pilots, Governments, Officials, uh, come uh, on the record about UFOs or whatever. I mean, it's just, just really good work. But Well, didn't um, she do the New York Times thing to you? Yeah. So that seems yeah. like we should have her on. Yeah, maybe. It's on a lot of levels. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. I don't know if she would come on. Really? Yeah. Well, I'm not she, sure. 
doesn't like your cookout. Well, she, I don't think, I don't know how many shows she's been on about it. I mean, obviously she's going to go on Open Minds and talk to Alejandro about it. And he asked a lot of those important questions. Right? He asked those big questions and they describe the frustration about the conspiracy angle of it. But, you know. Are you buddies with Alejandro? Aren't you <clears throat> pals? No, I've met him before, but I, I'm not really in contact with him anymore. But he's on Twitter. Is he? I don't, know. Oh, I don't know. Probably. I mean, whatever. We'll, we'll talk about it. I mean, I'm interested in exploring the other side. I mean, you know, Walter and a bunch of people probably there is, you know, there is a lot of pushback, which I think is good that the UFO community is being skeptical of this. I mean, why should we trust it now all of a sudden? You know, they've been lying to us for fucking 70 years about different shit and not just the UFOs. I mean, government and the mainstream media has been pretty much a joke. What do you, I mean, what do you think? Do you have any comments at all about it or? I had a big long rant in my head about it and I, you know. It came off kind of weak. What? I don't have a rant about it. I'm not passionate enough about it. I can get ranty about some things. Yeah. But not about, I can get ranty about the New York Times and I'm not feeling it at 11 o'clock at night. All right, dude. All right. Okay. I just, I thought that was appropriate for the, this episode because we talk a lot about the secret space program and about the breakaway civilization and about some of this ufology going back to the mid 1800s and <laughs> technology back then. And, you know, Ooh, the airships. there is, there is, you know, you could sort of draw a line between a lot of this stuff and it does seem to be. You know, when guys like Tom DeLonge get super political and super aggro against the current administration, aggro, it it makes you wonder, right? Why, why, if they're that political and they're coming out with this, and the other disclosure advocates are very political, so why now all of a sudden? But there's a lot of positivity to getting some attention. It did pr bring a lot of people that we're on the fence over to one side that maybe there is something legit and they do have a really good interview there on the open minds. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes as well, just so people can, uh, can listen to it. Sounds good, brother. Anything right on, else? Buddy. I no, think that's that about, about it. Wraps it up. Yep. Eh? Thanks for putting up with my bullshit. Putting up with ground bullshit. Now you, uh, you had enough of our bullshit. We can get into some that's of Mr. Great. Walter Bosley's anything but bullshit. <laughs> Enjoy the chat, guys. It's a gooder. We're super excited to have Walter Bosley with us. He's been investigating historical occult mysteries, which includes the breakaway civilization and the secret space program. And he's been in the national security complex for years and with the FBI and he's written a, a whole whack of books and he's speaking at conferences and we're going to pick his brain about all this good stuff. We just had Joseph Farrell on a couple weeks ago and he's going to be the perfect, uh, perfect capstone to that. So welcome to the show, Walter. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, good to be talking with you guys. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, we just had a really good chat with with Joseph Farrell, and a lot of your stuff seems to overlap. And you were you were just visiting with him, so we want to hear about that a little bit. I mean, I I would absolutely love to hear you guys chit chatting for like five hours on stage together. It would be like the ultimate conference for us. Yeah, that would be uh, <laughs> that that would. <laughs> That'd be a blast. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Maybe that'll yeah. be the first Grand Maricon. Yeah, we just get those two guys on stage for like five hours talking about this stuff. I don't know. After the little hiccups we had just had trying to get this call started, I might be a little concerned of the security of the event. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So 
So yeah, we are recording twice here. We had to redo this this little intro. So Walter, we were, we were talking about uh, you sort of going over the history of of the breakaway civilization and the research that you've been doing, which really shows some credibility to to like I don't know if the secret space program is the right word because that kind of has more of a the context of the super soldier type stuff, but, and, you know, throwing all that stuff aside for now, you've really done a lot of research into the airship mystery and that there is something, you know, to be said for the breakaway civilization kind of expanding on, on Richard Dolan's theory there. So I think we should give people an update about that just to start us off. And then we can get into some of the more recent stuff about the supposed disclosure and the New York times article and maybe what we think is going on with that as well. Um, you know, what, what you said uh, uh, about secret space program and um, the, the connotation of, you know, like super soldier stuff, actually that speaks to, you know, my comment about breakaway civilizations. A lot of times people um, exaggerate, you know, um, what they think it might actually be. You guys can hear me now, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Loud and clear. Hey, good. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's, uh, I think sometimes people mistakenly uh, think of a breakaway civilization like those elites in the film Elysium, where they're living up on the Niven Ring, you know, in, in orbit, and they have this, uh, you know, this utopian, futuristic, you know, lifestyle going on. And, um, it... pardon? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. no, we can hear you. Yeah, and um, it it really, you know, in my view, it it wouldn't be like that. In fact, it doesn't need to be like that because breakaway civilization, you know, specifically, particularly within the definition that Richard Dolan has laid out, which is a very good definition, is um, uh, the emphasis is on independent, okay? Um, it, it's independent of our known civilization. They have you know, their own resources, they can develop their own technology. And, you know, even though they're developing their own technology, it doesn't mean that it has to be so drastically different from ours. It's just, you know, in, in some possibilities, you know, just perpendicular, you know, or to some degree perpendicular to what we have. But it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be living off this planet. Um, it means that they could very well have access to off-planet. And, yeah. you know, the similar thing for a secret space program, you know, um, it doesn't have to be this, you know, a century advanced, um, uh, you know, bionic soldiers and all this Starfleet stuff. Really, uh, particularly when you look from my perspective, where the, I think the secret space program has its roots in the 1950s, U.S. secret space program, um, the, the technology is closely parallel to what you know, NASA has, but a, you know, a, a military version of it. And maybe, in my opinion, 20 to 50 years ahead of our known um, space travel and military technology. And, and that's not really that far, you know, ahead. Um, well, it's not uh, bad, though, if you I, can I, see I, Musk with his uh, self-landing rockets and things like that. Like, 50 years ahead of that, when you look where we were 50 years ago, it could be... You know, you're probably not using fuel anymore and things like that, right? Well, I would, I, I would like to think that they have probably um, developed um, other means of propulsion and power systems. Yeah, other other than than rocketry. Um, I know people will point to rockets as you know the the, the big. Um, you know, damning evidence that there couldn't be this other technology because, you know, why would people still use rockets? Um, and, you know, I, I don't know uh, that, you know, that they also wouldn't, wouldn't be using rockets as well, but in enhancing that rocket performance um one way or another uh some say that with the apollo missions um the lift to return when they took off the um lunar module when when they took off uh some say that they might have used some type of anti gravity assist now a lot of times when you say anti gravity there's people out there that freak out well i'm talking about you know the the, the kind of anti gravity that we know 
is uh, built into the B two bomber, for example. Like, you know? like the leading so, edge, of the leading edge of the the wings and stuff like that, or they. Yeah, yeah, that that technology, which is very, you know, we can grasp that. That's tangible for us. It wouldn't be some mondo advanced again, you know, thing from a uh, from a science fiction movie, you know. Um, you know, it's also my opinion that uh, the, you know the size um, of a secret space program, as far as uh, number of personnel. You know, it's it's my opinion that uh, it would be somewhere around, you know, maybe only eight to ten thousand people. You know, would be the actual fully read in, working in space every day. You know, you know, bona fide members of secret means simply just classified. And, uh, yeah, it would definitely be, you know, the, a military program. So, um, again, between Breakaway and Secret Space Program, you know, these things don't have to be as way out there as a lot of people assume or, you know, like to pretend. Super exotic. Yeah, but the, the difficulty with that is that people do see some pretty large craft flying around the sky. And whether that's the large black triangles oh, now, it, or some of, like the, some of the, like... You know the the block like the Walmart size stuff that you know going around. I mean that might not be not might not be ours, but it's it's tantalizing to think that if we are off planet that we could be, you know, building that. I mean I don't know where all that money is going to come from, but there's definitely you know hidden money all over the place and missing trillions in the public eye for sure. Right. I mean who knows if some of that goes to that? I mean you can do a lot of a lot of shit with a couple trillion dollars. Yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, the level, you know, 20 to 50 years ahead could mean that they've figured out how to make these these giant things, the, either, you know, a massive craft or some type of massive structure, um, and, and yet still be within a tangible range of our known technology. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, they, yeah. they've, it could just mean they figured that out. Um, now, as far as the money... Yes, we know there's the missing trillions right there. We also know, particularly, you know, if you listen to Catherine Austin Fitz, you know, she has laid out that, you know, this continues, this has gone on for years, and it continues to go on, you know, the uh, the $50,000 toilet seat, the $12,000 wrench. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, come on. Uh, obviously, these things aren't costing that much. They're just, you know, uh, uh, Wash, the the money, money, yeah. handling yeah. the money to a classified program through these items. That's a no-brainer. But don't discount, when, particularly when you're talking about a breakaway civilization, um, but also a secret space program, um, resources in space. You know, there could already be mining going on. Here's the thing. None of us actually know for sure that a breakaway, for example, or even our secret space program, none of us knows for sure that they're, they haven't found, say, you know, a gold mine or a silver mine. You, you get the you get the idea, and um, from there could come uh, the source of uh, you know the the income for the money to fund all these programs. So, you know, we, you have to take into account what they're finding out there. Yeah, that's a good point. As well as, I mean, who knows? It could be even skimming shit off the drugs, the drugs from Afghanistan. I mean, all that kind of stuff could somehow, some of that could make it into this. I mean, there's a lot of ways where sort of money is being laundered at that at that secret level. You know, I I, I actually tend to doubt that drug money would go into funding a secret, secret space program. I, I think that, yeah, we know that goes on. But I think that um, that kind of source is used for for a little bit more down to earth political shenanigans and um, y you know uh, military influencing you know by y you get you use the skim money to provide you know a force that you want to arm with their means of arming without having to use the taxpayers' money so right, to speak. Right. I I really I don't know I I have serious doubts about you know um, that being used for secret space program. Yeah, that's a good point. I think if it was, it would have to be a little more um, even darker yet, because if you're going to start using money like that, that would even start to point to more of like a rogue intelligence agency. Yeah, some yeah, side uh, of the you government know, exactly. that's gone you're rogue. About a rogue thing. When, I, when I'm talking about secret space program, um, I mean an actual official but classified U.S. military space program, manned space program. 
Ah, see, it, to me, it seems ridiculous to think that they're not doing that. And yeah, doesn't it? it, it because we know the history. In my book, Shimmering Light, I get into this. We know the history. Um, after World War II, the, the U.S. Army Air Corps guys, specifically Colonel Harry Armstrong and then Otis Benson, these guys were all about advancing aerospace medicine science to put man in space. They were all about that. We know it's a matter of history that the Mercury program, remember the movie The Right Stuff? You know, Gordo Cooper and, and John Glenn and them, you know, being the first, you know, Americans in space and all that. That was about the Mercury program. And the Mercury program was mandated to the U.S. Air Force before NASA even existed, okay? The U.S. Air Force was the one who designed, you know, like 90% of, you know, the, the stuff you saw that NASA eventually used, okay? And then NASA was stood up, and, you know, they were publicly given Mercury, but we've never been told that the U.S. Air Force stopped pursuing man in space. Um, this is why I argue... Uh, that our secret space program, manned program, uh, dates back to the 1950s. And again, we're talking parallel, parallel technology. In other words, those those U.S. Air Force astronauts going on secret manned space missions, they were flying in the same Redstone rockets. They were flying in the same, you know, the little black capsule. They were wearing the same pressure suits. Uh, my dad's unit at George Air Force Base was involved in the ground testing of those very suits. Okay, so that's one of the sources how I, you know, learned about some of this. But, you know, it's all history. It's a matter of history you can find. This is not speculation on my part, the things I'm telling you, you know, Air Force having Mercury and Armstrong and Benson. This was not um, speculation. This is actual known history. So, yeah, I think it's crazy to think that uh, we wouldn't have a manned space program. There's no reason why we couldn't. Certainly no reason why we wouldn't. I always picture the the, the secret space program being a little more multinational, though. Like, you know, almost, uh, you know, an organization that um, supersedes all of the national interests and, and sort of more global in, in scale. So, I mean... Oh, that, that's heartwarming. I'm touched. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Listen, it grew out of the Cold War, my friend. Um, I, and I'm not saying Russia didn't attempt to have theirs or didn't to some degree, you know, have their secret space program. But this grew out of the Cold War. This was the high, space was the high ground. And um, uh, yeah, but your research you goes know, back to your research goes back to way before all that, though, before before the, the fucking wars happened where, you know, for one reason or another these world wars happened. I mean, you, you go back to, to the 18, 1900s there, there's some, some shady shit going on. So, but, but before yeah. we, before we go into that, have you seen, have you seen the iron sky movie? Have you ever watched it, Darren? No. Have you seen that, that one at all? Walter, I've seen iron sky. Yeah. Where, where they, where they bring out they're on, on that base. I don't know if I think it's on the base on the moon or whatever. The Nazis are up there and all the, all the fucking nationalities bring out their, their little secret spaceship. <laughs> together like they've, <laughs> yeah. they've all been doing it in secret i mean i thought that was quite funny i mean i picture it as being yeah. more than one of these organizations that has reached that like there could be multiple breakaway civilizations <clears throat> around the well, yeah, world. There, there, that's different there, there could more likely be multiple secret space programs um i don't i i doubt that because the the what, when I'm talking about secret space program, when you know, usually when you're talking about secret space program, in that case, you are talking about a a post World War II thing, okay? Right, okay, okay. And really, um, you know, the U.S. was probably in the post World War II era, probably the the wealthiest nation to come out of that. You know, to come out of that so wealthy, you know, because we had our economic boom in the 50s and, you know, we were just a powerhouse. So, you know, but it really, the only game in town on SSP back then probably would have been the United States and maybe Russia um, at that time. Um, so, you know, and, and at that time during the Cold War era, you know, yeah, we're talking a military organization and they would not have wanted to... Um, you know, have some type of goodwill UN kind of thing going with this. Although, you know, they say that, um, you know, JFK wanted to, 
you know, go into space peacefully with the Russians, and some theorize that that, that had something to do with his assassination. So, um, but you, when you're talking, like my research going back into the 1800s, remember that's breakaway civilization. Um, a breakaway civilization uh, can can by definition, you know, probably have a space program, but a secret space program within the framework that we're talking here is not a breakaway civilization. It's in this particular instance, government. In my opinion, hypothesis. It's yeah. It's it's within our military. It's a it's a thing of our DoD, Department of Defense. That's the kind of the way I'd look at it too. Like I find it hard to believe that the U.S. doesn't have satellites that can start shooting shit if they need to. Already, sure. like, guaranteed. Yeah. And and to think that that wasn't happening while we were doing doing these crazy arms races for thermonuclear warheads, you know, I think right. that was kind of what you've seen. Well, on the other side, you're developing satellites that can, you know, kill the power in half, you know, half a country or, or things like that. And I yeah. think it'd be silly to think that, you know, these days, do you think that, so do you... I would assume these days that Russia, you know, India, China, all these people probably have some sort of a secret space program. Or is it the sort of thing where we've gotten up there, not we, but the U.S. or the Russians have gotten up there in such a capacity that that it's not, you know, they're like, no, 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 you come up here and it's not going to go well for you. I mean, the other thing is you can't be having dead astronauts on the news every fucking three months either, right? There was no way that they were going to keep going with national news every single mission. You you mean on the, you're referring to the civilian stuff or? Yeah, like I think the civilian was always just to an appease the public sort of thing. And then, you know, like I said, they always had backup plans for dead astronauts. I think it was the dog and pony show. Um, I, I don't think that the, the 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 peaceful scientific exploration part was uh, not sincere. I, I do think, you know, that they they seriously have been doing just science for pure science. Absolutely, but yeah, it was just as m- much a dog and pony show as it was uh, a scientific effort. What we've done so far with um, the manned space program on the issue of because you bring up a good point, you know, if there's stuff going on up there, you know, human beings, things happen, people get killed either by accident or whatever's going on. And, you know, some people have said, well, um, if they were putting people up in space. We would know about it because the life support systems require, you know, their own kind of communication signals and, and all this stuff. And my counter to that is, come on, you know, they've learned how to code so many things in, commu- in you know, communication. You're telling me they can't find a way to, to code and camouflage, you know, the, these kinds of communicate. You know, it's it's ridiculous. They can shoot people up there without, you know, without us knowing it. And also when, when things happen, if things have happened and they've lost anyone, you know, people have gotten killed. The way you cover that is, um, you know, Sergeant so-and-so or Lieutenant so-and-so was tragically killed in a training accident at such and such base in South Carolina or, uh, you know, in such and such operation over in Saudi, when the fact is they were killed in a secret space program operation. Okay. But you can bury that you know, with the legendary, you know, training accident or, you know, helicopter goes down in the Himalayas, obviously, you know, somewhere where there's nobody there to actually see it go down or, or you can have an actual crash. Okay. And, uh, you can just kind of say when there were two people on the plane or three, you can add on a couple more, say they were on the plane doing a undisclosed work. And, you know, if they never find the aircraft, I say in quotation marks, you know, um, there's no way to prove those guys were not on the airplane. See, so, you know, there is a way to get people up there uh, without anyone knowing it. There is a way to cover for, you know, if, if they get killed, um, you know, the only issue you've got is your personnel, um, keeping their mouth shut what about and, the press, uh, you, you though, know, Walter? we can have about how they do that. What about the press though, Walter? Wouldn't they be all over that? Shouldn't this all be on what? CNN? Well, I just, uh, I think uh, it's uh, funny the way that, you know, in the last couple of years it's become in, um, increasingly apparent that how 
fake the media and the news and everything else is, and it's just kind of an extension of the government. So, you know, it, it, it's starting to seem, even to people who aren't sort of paying attention, it's starting to seem apparent that they could be hiding whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, regardless of the, you know, um, I guess you're, you, you know, you'd be thinking of like an investigative journalist. Well, you know, look, look what has happened to some investigative journalists who have dug deep into certain things. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, the press is busy doing other things. Um, I don't think now we're having this conversation, okay? And this is a conversation that is fairly recent. So maybe there's some journalist out there who's hearing what we're talking about, who has heard what Catherine Austin Fitz has talked about, and you know maybe you know now they'll hear that and say, hmm, maybe someone ought to dig into this, and who knows, perhaps they'll find something and uncover it. But you know, people like myself and and Joseph, Catherine Austin Fitz, and others, we are those people who are digging into things. See, and this is what we're putting out there as our hypothesis based on what we're finding. Yeah, and you'll never, you know, we will never get a spot on on the mainstream media to to talk about this stuff. I mean, I think I think your point, Darren, is that even if they had these stories, if you know how it's not going to ever be on that platform no. for the masses to sort of to sort of see. But I mean, I think that this, that's ending soon. I mean, that this alternative media and the new media is sort of taking over now. I think that you know, there's uh, well, but then YouTube's doing their big purge. Who will be purging next? You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, we just had difficulties tonight starting up. I mean, we had, we took, it took us an hour to get started on multiple platforms and we've never been, you know, and I'm not saying there's any nefarious things going on, but it is, we, we haven't really had any of these problems until uh, tonight, eh, Darren, like this to this extent. That's right. I mean, the beauty with audio is that it's still in a lot of ways self-hostable, but video, that's the problem is you need those, you need those, you need someone to take that expense because hosting your own video is not going to be easy. Yeah. Even audio well, gets you know, expensive. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, even, I mean, even hosting your own audio is going to cost you, you know, thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, uh, uh I, what, what crossed my mind was, do the guys who, you know, do, do the, do the Corey goods and the Basiagos and the, the people telling the ridiculous stories, do they have a lot of trouble, you know, when they go on shows? I, I don't recall. It seems like, you know, the airwaves are clear that, you know, um, the, the wifi is working, everything seems to work for them. But when you're talking about researchers that are a little bit more nuts and bolts, try to keep it a little bit more legit, you know, these are the researchers that have trouble getting a spotlight. These are the researchers that, gee, can't seem to make Skype work or or, or, um, or Zoom or whatever. And, um, you know, you got to ask yourself, hmm, you know, um, isn't that interesting? You know, of course they're going to let the BS have free flow. And, you know, the people that are looking at things realistically, those are the ones that they want to kind of put roadblocks in front of. So there, there's the bone for those that want to, you know, go down the uh, paranoia route. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, that's, um, you know, those guys, uh, oh man, I don't know what to say about that. I, I feel like I've heard you talk about this before and I do sort of understand a little bit clearer now the progression of the SSP and the legitimate mm-hmm. research, and at least at least with some evidence there, and then having having it kind of been taken over a little bit by by these guys, you know, these so called whistleblowers, and they don't have a lot of evidence to back it up. And I mean, it's it's tough because how you know are they are they making the stuff up? Are they just patsies? Are they you know are do they really do they believe what they're talking about? This did, did this happen? And then I mean, in some ways. Is there room? Is there room for some of that as well? It's it's really it's really tough. It's like tearing apart the community. Well, and I think that's part of the objective of those who are ultimately behind this. What you've got are definitely guys who are making crap up, and uh, possibly guys who have been fed nonsense, but they're they're buying it because of the way it's been presented to them. And they've been pumped up, um, 
and uh, you might you might even have guys that actually believe you know this uh, crazy stuff they're saying um, it's some combination of three and of those three and I think that the majority of it is is guys making crap up so what would what would like the perfect whistleblower look like for the secret series program somebody that could bring documentation and a history and something like would would that even ever I mean you can't even really hope that that would ever happen the actual whistleblower is going to be somebody who can provide documentation maybe even uh, 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 you know uh, video or film that has provenance okay there would be no question about it and quite frankly it would be a one-shot deal they would come out and it wouldn't be long before you'd see him sitting before Congress okay in a hearing um, it would be it would be not something that you're going to hear on you know that other that radio show that's the big juggernaut <laughs> um, it, it's you know not something that you're going to see even at conferences where I've spoken at okay the real whistleblower is going to be on every major you know for better or worse like it or not they're going to they're going to be hitting the mainstream news it's going to be breaking news they're going to be eventually hauled before congress i mean it would be that big the real whistleblower you know um what we have so far are just guys telling stories and taking the spotlight from legitimate researchers sucking up all the air in the room you know uh, the, the the public's um, the public's margin for attention. All this uh, attention to all this, you know, um, they they pretty much suck all that up so that they then won't pay attention to any legitimate research. There is there still a whole is there still a whole SSP movement with conferences and stuff like that, or did that sort of peter out a couple of years ago after this happened? Well, what happened was yeah, for for a couple of years, two years in a row. Um, the uh, organization that put on the conferences that uh, Joseph Farrell, Fitz, uh, Mark McCandlish, Michael Schratt, um, John Brandenburg, and, and you know several of the others were, were speaking at, uh, they did two of those in a row, and they, they did a different conference, what would have been the third year in a row. And during that time, um, at the Bastrop Conference in 2015, the one I spoke at, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the shills for Wilcock and good were there at that event leading up to that event. They were, you know, kind of constantly barraging the, any firms re related to that event, you know, saying, how can you not Corey good here? You know, Corey good's got to speak here. And, and they were told repeatedly because this is a, evidence-based, nuts and bolts, serious, legit SSP researcher conference. And then there, and the, the Corey Goodchills even showed up at the event and, you know, they had to inject him into the Q&A. So, you know, they were beginning to attempt to usurp these kinds of events, the attention for them uh, back in 2015. They were really turning up their effort to do that. And, you know, they finally got themselves um, a whole day on the MUFON stage, of course, last summer. And uh, this, a lot of us see this as a uh, as an intended uh, strategy that they were doing. And, and it really has diverted, um, kind of derailed serious SSP research. Um, not so much the research, but the... Um, the spotlight. The, the, public, the, the public activity, the... the SSP media. Who, um, who was it who was going out? Who did we have on ground that was going out by area 51 and taking videos of shit uh, taken off and stuff like that at night? Like, is that where some of the stuff is happening or do you think there's multiple launch sites? Is there something going on down in Antarctica? You know, is area 51 a spot where, where all do you think these things would be taken off from? Well, personally, I think they can be, uh, for example, taking off from uh, Vandenberg, for instance, whenever there's a rocket launch there. Um, you know, you and I and any naysayers on this, we don't have access to the payloads, okay? 
we don't know what's really on board those rockets. They could be launching people in space every time or every other time. None of us here tonight can prove otherwise. So they, they could do this from, you know, known facilities, or they can do it, you know, out in the boon, out in the middle of nowhere at nighttime. Hmm. What do you think? What do you think about um, oh, this whole? I mean, just sticking with the current times before we get back into your fascinating history of of the you know like the airships and the NIMSA and all that because I think that's very important. Um, and I got a couple questions on that for you. Um, so the, this, you know, to the Stars Academy and the New York Times article. I mean, I had a friend of mine tell me that he you know he believes now in UFOs because of this article. I mean, it's 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 kind of you know in some ways it's it's good. In some ways, it's sad that uh, it takes something from a place like that to write an article and all of a sudden everybody's jumping on board. But then you know the UFO community kind of deconstructs this thing and doesn't really buy in. And I feel like similar thoughts, you know, to you where I feel like it's a deep, deep state move that, um, you know, I wanted to hear your thoughts, thoughts on that, that, you know, that could be providing, you know, the platform for the next step. And I feel like it's, you know, globalism is on its heels right now. And if somebody wants to keep that going, what, what is the final, final move, you know? Well, um, yeah, I, I think as far as, you know, like ETSA, the Two Stars Academy thing, and the DeLong thing, uh, what I was talking about a moment ago, how the crazy whistleblower, nutty story guys really came in and, and forced themselves onto the stage and really stole the spotlight from legitimate SSP researchers and diverted attention from what they were doing to attention to the nonsense, they had their time, you know, about probably a year, a year and a half where they had successfully achieved this strategy. And then they were quickly, um, uh, as they were, you know, getting hit with uh, critique and people were really coming back and saying, you know what, you guys are, are full of nonsense, you're full of crap. Um, very quickly, then we have, you know, DeLong and, and his characters fully emerge, finally. And uh, once again, you know, in, in this particular case, we see, you know, uh, former CIA guys and, and um, you know, DeLong saying, hey, uh, trust us, trust us. We are going to be revealing all this stuff. You're, you're going to get um, disclosure through confirmation first and all this. And then, of course, repeatedly as they would release little things, uh, almost immediately it would be shown to not be what DeLong and company were saying it was. So it began to fall apart quickly. But what I find interesting is, you know, um, up until this TTSA Academy, or this TTSA, the To the Stars Academy um, outfit, uh, anybody that had been CIA you know, to the ufology people, they were the bad guys. They were villains. You know, hey, don't trust these guys. Don't trust them at all. But then something magically happened when, when Tom DeLong brings them together. I mean, really? You, you know, what's going on here? Um, it, it has amazed me, you know, the people that have embraced what these guys are, are saying and cranking out and trying to pass off. Um, when, uh, you know, before they never, they never would have trusted them for five minutes. So, you know, did these guys just step up their game? I think that's part of it. I think by coming out and saying, oh, we're on your side, you know, um, I really wanted to share this with, with the whole country and the whole world, but I had to wait till I retired, and I'm on your side, I'm one of you. Well, I, I mean, coming from a national security background, I mean, I smell a rat right there from the get-go. And uh, so, you know, I'm not buying what Elizondo's selling. OK, um, I'm not buying what TTSA is selling. Now, I think that some of them have been kind of misled and duped. I, I kind of, you know, think that maybe uh, poor DeLong has been uh, kind of a patsy for them to embed a perception management game in his thing. They took his dream and his vision and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll play along because somebody in, you know, the 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 
operations room said, hey, we can use this um, for perception management. And I think that's what it is. I think that's what they're doing. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, you know, what a better way to then, I mean, and I think it's going to get, get worse. I mean, that could be, that could be just a tipping point. I mean, if, 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 if the globalist agenda starts to keep slipping through their fingers, like it is, there's a couple, there's a couple more plays left, right? It's, it's taking this acknowledgement of there being ETs and, and this exotic technology and creating, you know, a global scare. Well, let's go back to the legend of what Werner von Braun said on his deathbed, right? What, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's hogwash. It never happened. Other people believe it religiously. But, you know, let's look at this. You know, it is interesting that before what we're talking about with TTSA, that this legend existed, you know, that von Braun said that, you know, okay, they're pushed to globalism. You know, it's going to start with, uh, uh, you know, there was the Cold War, and that's going to be followed by the era of terrorism, and then that's going to be rogue uh, nations. And, and climate, then climate finally, change when you eat the invasion. Yeah, I think climate um, change was even in there. I think. Pardon? I think climate change was even in there. Like there was another step. Uh, maybe, I, th- I thought there was I'm a not step. Sure climate yeah. change was, but the point yeah. is, you know, ultimately von Braun said the last one's going to be a fake stage, you know, ET invasion. Okay, so you know we've gone through the Cold War, the terrorism, the rogue nations. Um, we're kind of still in the rogue nation part, um, but here they are. I think it could be said that you know what what Elizondo and these TTSA agency guys are doing is setting up the first stages of that last thing Von Braun pointed to, the staged ET um, event. So people have to keep that in mind, you know, rather than just blindly want, want it to be so true that there's ETs that they're just throwing all caution to the wind and, and drinking the Kool-Aid by the gallon, which is what some people are doing. You know, and and they have start, They have actually, from what I understand, from you know what some people have told me, they they've actually reached outside of TTSA and have talked with people who you know claim to be experiencers, you know, and UFO witnesses, and kind of made them feel part of the whole thing, and now you know, kind of then dumping them. It, it's and and. You know, it's just mind games. So, and yet, some of these people, even though that's been done to them, according to them, they're still putting their blind faith and trust in this, and it's it's kind of um, scary and sad at the same time. So, if this was just a move for perception management, did it did it work? Did it backfire? What do you think? I don't think it's working, and I think uh, they can see that it's not working. There's enough of us that, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at this with a critical eye. We're not drinking the Kool-Aid, um, and we're, we're vocal. Now, how much longer that will last, that goes back to, for instance, we're talking about the YouTube purging that's going on now. They're starting with, you know, political stuff. You know, and, and things like that. But who knows? Maybe, maybe down the road they'll start silencing guys like me and guys like you guys that you know question things like TTSA. Um, who knows? Yeah, yeah, that's crazy, huh? Darren, do you want to? Don't question the TTSA. I guess. <laughs> well, I think you know when it comes out in the Times, it's it makes me wonder because it just seems like that would. <laughs> you can't believe anything else. <laughs> Well, it would fall in line with, with exactly that. If if you were going to run that, the Times would be the first paper to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, yeah, absolutely. It shouldn't surprise us at all that, you know, the Times played along with this. And, you know, we're the, we're the do it for um, this to be done. Um, yeah, I can't, I, I mean, I know it sounds cynical. I know, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear it, but um, I do think that, that whole thing is uh, is perception management. That does not mean that I'm saying ETs don't exist and they've never come here. On the contrary, I you know I'm convinced they they must exist, and I do think that they've come here yeah, um, yeah. and probably still do. Yeah. So I mean, for people that haven't followed the the super soldier thing in the secret space program and the more the more mm-hmm. exotic part of it. Uh, we haven't really touched on it. I mean, we've talked about, we've had a lot of, you know, UFO shows and, and 
talked a lot about that and, and ETs as well, but we haven't really gone down that, that rabbit hole too deep. So for people don't know, and when we talk about, you know, Corey Good's examples just being a bunch of bullshit, can you, can you sort of highlight a couple of those examples for people just so they understand more of the context of what we're talking about? Sure. It's very simple. Corey Good claims that when he was a kid, or, or I believe 16 years old, that he was uh, recruited to be a, uh, uh, a Marine commando transported across space to Mars, where he served in a war against some type of, I think it was reptilian aliens, I don't know, reptilians or insects or whatever, and he did that for 20 years, and then he was traveled back in time and, and put back in his 16-year-old body and, um, you know, the memory suppressed. And uh, let's see, let me do another one um, that he says. He claims that to this very day, um, at nighttime on random nights, he will be uh, visited by a blue sphere, okay, a blue sphere that uh, envelops him and takes him up to space to um, meet with this, uh, I guess, this extraterrestrial um, Senate gathering um, where he, Corey Good, out of all the billions of people on Earth, he is, you know, an ambassador representative um, for humanity to this group of, and here it comes, blue avians. Yes, blue bird people. Yeah, it's... Need I say more? <laughs> well, the problem... the, like problem the ones is... from Avatar? Well, no, more bird, bird-like. More bird-like. For some reason, they seem bird-like. No, they're not really bird-like. So the problem as well, not just in what you were describing, is is it kind of ends up damaging the the other people and the other communities going out trying to make contact as well. Like there's a people disclosure movement as well, and there's a new age. And then this is also sort of throws a bunch of dirty water on the new age thing as well. So I feel like, yes. I feel like it's, it's, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now these guys are fucking laughing at me here, but you know, but it, it's true, right? I mean, we, we go out in oh, groups no, you're, and we make, here's, here's what you run to. Here's what you run to. Okay. When they come out with this kind of crap, what it does also is it heads off at the pass any legitimate whistleblower that might come out, you know, and by telling these exaggerated, ridiculously nutty uh, versions of this, let's say someone who actually had experienced some type of time distortion technology or whatever, they come out and try to talk about it. That's already been spoiled to the public ear, but in the public ear by the ridiculous stories of a Corey Good or Andrew Bassiago or any of the others who claim this or even straight up contact i mean there are groups of people all over the world making contact you know and 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 we know you've 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 learned enough about about all this stuff too i mean the channeling and the contact type stuff is there's some there's some legitimacy to some of that so it's hard now that they have this not only are they coming out and kind of raining on the real research for the ssp but they're also I, i i tend to look at it this way um not that, like we, when you mentioned the instances of what we would call channeling or people making contact, um, here's the thing. I do not um, dismiss at all the possibility that these things may be happening, you know, are happening. And uh, But what I, I generally question the surety the of people those. and are very public about it. Yeah. What, yeah. what I tend to think is you're – the vast majority of your true witnesses and experiencers are not people you hear on these shows. They're not people writing about it in books. They're, they, they're very private about it, um, for, you know, their own reasons, um, maybe even reasons inherent in the experience itself. So unfortunately you got to kind of be careful with the people that are talking about it publicly, uh, because, you know, quite frankly, we, uh, you know, learn all too often that, that you know there's a lot of shenanigans going on with that. I think it's, you know, it's people also want attention, or they want to sell a book, or they you know, whatever they want to make that quick buck. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm I'm more of I, I I'd rather say I'd be careful of how they talk about it in public. I mean, I think there's a learning experience here for a lot of people, and it's it is 
you know, a mind opening concept that some people might be making some sort of contact. It's, I think it's how they talk about it. If it's very dogmatic and matter of factly and, you know, I mean, we, we don't have any answers here on this show. Darren and I ask a lot of questions and we really don't know what the fuck is going on. So we try to talk, right. you know, but I mean, I'm also going out there meditating in a circle with people trying to make contact, but I, and I, and we've seen some shit, but I don't have any answers. I still don't have any answers. So, but I, but I feel like it's important to talk about it. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, and talk about it without debating it. You know, that's another thing that just was really killing the discussion, you know, for, for some years now, we've had these, these guys who have a fetish for debate. And what that does is it really turns a discussion into a bickering match. And, you know, he who wins the bickering match is allegedly the one, you know, who, who wins the debate and, and discussion is over, you know, and that really, I, I, I saw that coming to a crescendo that was just annoying to the point where I personally, I'm not going to debate stuff. Um, in my books, I say, look, I research this. Um, this is my speculation. This is my hypothesis. And I tell the reader, you decide for yourself. I do not attempt to go out there and convince Anybody, I, I expect them to do their own thinking and come to their own conclusions. And of course, the debate boys hate that. Who, who are the That's debate boys? Huh? Who, who are the debate boys? Oh, just I, I'm not. I mean, I'm not talking like, about anyone specific. You know, there, there are no other host guys. You know, no, that no. I'm, I'm rag. I'm, a bit I'm, of I'm a, just saying a lot of them you encounter in the forums guy. and you know, them you encounter on shows. I, I don't, I'm not going to name anybody, but I mean, I think everybody knows, you know, somebody who's just in love with, yeah, you know, everybody knows somebody who took a logic class in college and be, they just become a pain in the ass in every social situation. That's what I'm talking <laughs> okay, about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. And I think in a I, lot of the ways, guys who are in love with logic and I've never met a female who acts like this. It's always, it's always males. <laughs> and, um, you, you know, I, I, my point is that they kill discussion, you know, and discussion should mean, well, here's what I think about this. And even if you disagree with it, it's like, Oh, okay, that's cool. Here's what I think about that. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that was, that's discussion and nobody's trying to force a conclusion on anyone. Um, you know, and, and that gets killed you know, by the, uh, um, Greg Bishop told me a, a phrase, I don't know if it's original with him, but, uh, the, you know, these guys suffer, some of them suffer a certainty fetish. That's another <laughs> fetish out there. They, they have to know it has to be certain. And if something's in the gray area, they don't want to hear about it. It's nonsense. So, you know, it can be proven. Well, we're talking about something here that it, it's in the gray area, a lot of it. And so that- you have to discuss it to even grasp, you know, the, the basic concept. And, um, so yeah, this, uh, this just all goes back to what you were saying a moment ago about, you know, do we, we should talk about these things. Yeah. And that, and that certainty fetish is on both sides. I mean, it's on the skeptical community and it's also on the people that just wholeheartedly believe that Corey good is a time traveling super soldier. I got into well, a debate well, I don't know on if the it's vaccine article there, today. They'll, so. they'll just they'll they buy that, and and they don't need any. Uh, they just his word is good enough, and the word of these guys who spread that are good enough because you know they want to believe. Um, okay. Yeah, what were you saying, Dan? Uh, I said, well, I was going to say to that point that I think. Also, there's a, I think a, a lot of people can get sucked into that mode on certain subjects or on, in, the, in today's hyper fucking information and things like that. Because just today I got sucked into a debate on a fucking global news website about fucking vaccinations. And it's just like, you know, it just started with one comment and then, you know, the next thing you know, I've been there for 15 minutes and it's like, I got to pull out. So you're one of those debate I got I got to pull up. Yeah. Yeah. But I just got triggered. But I am a debate. Yeah, I can. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it but, uh, you know, ultimately what it does is it just, you know, raises people's blood pressure. And, and um, uh, you know, like I said, I, I call it bickering. And uh, But at the same uh, time, you know, I think we're I, I missing that in a lot of ways in today's society. Like, not debate so much, but definitely discourse. 
it's like everyone's sort of tribed off and, and fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. No one wants to hear what the other guys are saying. And I think, you know, that kind of plays a role as well. We, we've kind of lost that ability to have discourse without it turning into debate and exactly. name calling. Well, and, and it's because there's that one or two guys that are going to sit there and pick apart how you say something rather than listening to what you're trying to convey, even even somewhat imperfectly. Uh, that's the thing is these guys want to pick apart the mechanics of what you're saying and how you're saying it rather than just trying to hear you out and understand. And they're just, they just killed it. You know, they killed discourse. They killed discussion. They actually they killed the inherent um, uh, uh, kind of mystical fun about all these subjects, you know, cause let's face it, there, there is, there is this enticing, um, fun part of this stuff, fun for the mind. And, you know, the, these guys we're talking about, they killed that because they had to insist, you know, that it be proven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's ha- and it's happening more of a, on a political social level, I think, than, than this esoteric stuff. Oh, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you mean what I'm talking about? These these guys doing that? Oh, no, they're rampant in, you know, you, you go, like, go into forums. You know, that's where you see them mostly. You know, go into forums on ufology and, and the paranormal. I mean, check out the Paracast forum, for crying out loud. Oh, my God. You know, yeah. That's just Is one the ex- Paracast still going? Uh, what's that? Is the Paracast still going? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, that forum's you know, always so, been a little risky. These guys are still out there, but uh, I think they're they've been getting resistance over the last couple of years, and they're they're kind of being pushed back a little bit because people, again, people. Let's. Uh, can we uh, can we cycle back? Do you think to to your more historical research on the breakaway? Absolutely. I, I'm really looking forward to hearing that. It's uh, it's just it's one of those kind of mind-blowing things that once you hear it again you realize that how how much potential this yeah i'd like to just kind of maybe before we do that transition maybe just a a nice another another quick little summary of the difference between the two because i think some of our listeners might get confused and thinking the two are one and the same like i was what you mean the difference between the breakaway civilization and the secret space program yeah exactly okay uh well it uh uh, the uh, and, and this is within this is in the framework that I put it, and um, the secret space program, okay, um, from my point of view, and I, I think from the evidence, is you're talking about something, for example, in the post World War II era, okay, something that is a program run by you know a government, a nation, uh, usually with um, in their military because that would be the primary purpose of a secret space program. Okay, it's it's not a Masonic cabal of science weenies. Um, it, it's, you know, the reason it's classified is so that you can have the high ground. Your nation, you know, and your allies can have the high ground in the event of another big, you know, world war or, or whatever. So, so that's, okay, it's program, okay? That implies smaller than, you know, a program is much smaller than a, a civilization, so to speak. Now, the breakaway civilization is a group with the, 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 the resources, um, and they're not necessarily a national group. They can be just, you know, people that, are, have, that come together for, you know, at, uh, philosophical reasons outside nationality. Um, and, you know, they have the sufficient um, funds and resources, whatever, to develop a technology um, probably, uh, you know, um, close to what exists in the known civilization, but uh, different enough that they could call it all their own or, or even far enough out there that it could literally be all their own and perpendicular to ours, but it provides them with what they need to not have to uh, be bound to our known civilization. You know, in other words, you know, their monetary uh, functions and and systems could be their own. Their... um, they could have their own bank, you know, own banking system. They could uh, um, go wherever they want, um, you know, 
basically not be tied politically or even governmentally to you know any known um, nation or political body uh, you know in the known civilization uh, truly so that would include like crossing borders and things like that well here here's the thing crossing borders uh, look at it this way you know um, citizens of various countries when they cross a border they they do it under the rules of the the borders of the nations whose border they're crossing okay so no i mean wh- when they're when they're interacting with our civilization they they still uh, you know individually are subject to uh, you know those processes okay but what we're talking about for example would be they would not be a citizen of any of the known nations um they could be but they you know they they wouldn't have to be um uh, you know that that's what i mean um when when we have um say a banking crisis for example it wouldn't affect them because their resources are independent of ours um, you know, uh, if we have a depression, it wouldn't affect them again for the same reason. Um, they could say, you know, buy an island out in the middle of the ocean and, um, you know, do essentially whatever they wanted, um, theoretically, without having to worry about military action of the known nations, you know, um, because they're independent and they would have their own technology that they could stand up to those military or police functions of anybody that, you know, would want to stop them from doing something. Now, you could read something nefarious into that, but you could also you could also just as easily read into, you know, let's say they're they're wanting to live a certain way and be free of the nonsense that we'd all like to be free of, okay? Yeah. They would have the ability to be able to do that and give the finger to the globalist authorities trying to, you know, force their totalitarianism on them, see? So it's not necessarily – a lot of times people equate breakaway civilization with, oh, it must be bad. It must be, you know, you know a bunch of nefarious guys, and that's not the case. Not the case all the time. I guess. Like, I mean, so if Graham and I decide to go off and start a commune, technically that's some sort of a breakaway civilization. Yeah. If it gets yeah, big it, 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 It's rudimentary. You know, that's what you're doing. You're, you're, if you decided, let's say you decided to buy an, you know, the proverbial island out in the middle of the South Pacific that's way out in international waters, okay? It, and, and you buy it outright. You own that island, okay? And you grow your own food. Um, you mine your own mineral resources, you uh, build your own uh, technology structure, that you would be a breakaway. You might not be a very powerful one, but yes, by definition, you would be a breakaway. Because the key is independence. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that they're this almighty powerful thing like we see in the movies. The key is independence. Yeah, I have a hard time. I have a hard time with that one. I I feel like it's got to be more of a more of a had they have more cabal. global you control more of a cabal they're more of like they've got the leaders of the you know the hidden leaders of the world in that in that civilization and that's one of the main reasons why we don't know what's going on with the ufo mystery i mean they're they're the ones keeping the lid on on things because from that perspective you can't you're not seeing it as anything but those dirty guys they're trying to have some you know they got one up on us they're you know and um more yeah more like a corporate more like a uh, corporate space program. there's two breakaways go ahead i'm sorry no i was thinking more like a corporate space program like more of a a corporate breakaway well there 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 could be that certainly i'm sure there's some corporations that would love to have that i mean you know think about it isn't that what elon musk is kind of doing yeah maybe ge you know, already did um, it there, there could be that but it doesn't necessarily have to be that um you know uh for instance of the two that i talk about um i actually uh I, if my hypothesis is accurate to any degree, I would not blame the guys who I call the 1903 for breaking off and wanting, you know, to just go their own way. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a lot of nonsense and crap in this world. And uh, why put up with it if you don't have to? Yeah. Yeah. True. So that that's kind of what I was going to, what I was going to go well, ahead. The other then. angle of that is without even space and things like that. I mean, you've got guys at Google and at Kurzweil Industries that are, could be working on their own little different form of breakaway civilization. 
you know, Kurzweil's taken so many fucking different pills and supplements and, you know, tech this and tech that, that, you know, if he started, if those guys started living to be an extra 30 years longer than us, then that would be a, another breakaway. Yeah. If again, it, yeah. If they joined together and they just went off and did their own thing to not really be subject to, uh, uh you know, the, the laws, so to speak, or it's more like not subject to the ups and downs of our financial system because they got their own money, you know, to be able to defend their position, their place, because they got their own technology uh, slash military, right? Um, and, of course, that in itself, when you start getting on that level, that implies, you know, great wealth and vast resources, of course. You know, of course, I'm not trying to dismiss, you know, that possibility. You know, three, you know, uh, us three or four guys couldn't go, you know, uh, tomorrow um, establish a breakaway civilization that could compete with any government on Earth you know, their military or anything, uh, you know, you, you do have to have, you know, I had a couple of tricks resources. up my sleeve, Walter. <laughs> What's that? I got a couple of tricks up my sleeve. <laughs> so, so, so uh, let's, let's... I, you know, it, it's, um, it, uh, anyway, I, I think we, I, I think we've established the difference between a breakaway and a secret space program. The secret space program, talking about that, that's an element within a greater organization. The breakaway civilization would be that greater organization. And when I specifically speak of secret space program, I mean the secret space program of the United States Department of Defense. Okay, and, and I'm not speaking about whatever space program a breakaway may or may not have. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Okay, so let's get into into some of the history then, going back to... The roots of the 1903, yeah. Well, I have taken my hypothesis and my speculations. Um, I've, you know, looked at pieces and, and, and followed threads, and, and I think that I can thread together um, the, the legends um, or, or the, the story that Charles Delshaw told of the Sonora Aero Club. Um, I think I can tie that, thread that to the, um, airship mystery of the 1890s and how both of these um, and all the events surrounding them led into um, you know ultimately our our uh, military industrial complex you know of our times and, and before that the Nazis and what their scientists were doing their scientists and engineers and, and uh, um, I think what I've done is with this research in the uh, the 19th century milieu of airship mysteries, I think I've laid the groundwork for um, explaining uh, the, the, a lot of the UFO mystery and related topics that went on in the 20th century. Huh. That we think started with the Nazis, cold start with the Nazis. And no, that's not the case. I think I've laid the groundwork for how the Nazis got this technology. Right. Okay. Go ahead. And that goes, so that goes back to uh, to the Sonora Club. Yes, the the uh, the Sonora Aero Club, according to an, an interesting uh, gentleman named Charles Delshaw, who most see as nothing more than an outsider artist. Um, he left these very um, colorful and and amazing and enigmatic uh, books. Several books of these illustrations that he did of these flying devices um, called arrows a-e-r-o and he tells a story with these um, images and in that story a group of german immigrants with the secrets of uh, anti-gravity flight um, were designing and building and test flying these little contraptions these arrows in California in the 1850s, and the the technology that he illustrates in his books um, for all the world uh, looks like you know what we call that mercury vortex engine. More specifically, um, the, the the rudimentary um, uh, proof of concept of uh, what Joseph Farrell and, and others talk about with the Nazi Bell. 
only predating the Nazi bell by like 70 years, okay? <laughs> Again, we're talking proof of concept, rudimentary form here in the 1850s. Um, there was some intrigue. Delshaw tells about how the, this mysterious group called NIMZA, and it's an acronym, N-Y-M-Z-A, um, a, based in Germany, a lot of people have come out, and even since my research, have insisted that, you know, NIMSA was New York-based. That's what the NY means, and uh, unfortunately, they're wrong. They're just simply wrong because Delshaw tells us that it was a German-based organization, and uh, specifically Prussian because the 1850s was prior to the unification of the Prussian states into a single Germany. Um, you know, the, a, a, a Prussian military representative even visited the Sonora Aero Club uh, late in their existence um, to inform them that the parent organization was interested in a military application of these craft. And the leader of the Sonora Aero Club, a gentleman named Peter Menace, who held the secret of um, this propulsion lift and propulsion system, uh, you know, he spoke for the group when he said, we're not interested in that. We, we, we don't have stuff used for military application. And shortly after that, uh, Peter Menace, uh, you know, we are told, dies in a flight accident, um, allegedly an explosion. Now, whether he really died and, you know, was assassinated or whether he faked his death, we, we don't know. We can't tell. But uh, what's interesting is that um, in the decade that followed during the Civil War, a gentleman by the name of Solomon Andrews demonstrated um, similar technology for Abraham Lincoln's members of Abraham Lincoln's War Cabinet and uh, reporters in D.C. Um, there's even an article that was published on this, and we are told that Andrews was told, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We got a war to fight. Um, I propose, it's my speculation, my hypothesis. I propose that that is a cover story. I say that they indeed, you know, made a contract with Andrews to develop this technology after the war. And I think, I propose that this would have been America's first black technology project, okay? And, uh, you know, the war ends in 1865, and it's 30 years later that we start having the airship mystery of the 1890s. What I argue and propose, hypothesize, I want to be clear on that, is that the 30 years of development in this black project, okay, led to the, the craft that, you know, was seen throughout the Western United States in the 1890s. Now, these were, you know, the next generation beyond what the Sonora Aero Club was doing, according to the description. And, um, but in this particular case, there were, uh, you know, men who were known, men who could be traced, that were allegedly the crewmen on these things and talked to witnesses. Um, uh, there was Samuel Tillman, who was an Army colonel, and uh, Amos Dolbear, who was an engineer, scientist. You can look these guys up. They're, you know, you can Google them. They were real guys. There's their photos. And in my research, I've, I've looked into their backgrounds, and both their backgrounds um, support uh, the, the knowledge of the same rudimentary technology that the Sonora Aero Club would have been using, you know, but of course... The 40 years beyond their stage of development. Hmm. And it was out of this 1890s airship mystery that the um, whatever industrialists were brought together to make this happen, um, it's out of that group that I think um, that uh, another breakaway formed and, um, you know, went their own way in the in the early 1900s. Do you have any idea as to what sort of rudimentary tech they're using? Is it inflatable or hot air, or is it something, you know? No, no, no. It, it was, it, was, uh, it involved um, rotation, which implies torsion, okay? Like the, uh, allegedly, you know, the Nazi bell, you know, the, the counter-rotating uh, drums, that's what the bell was. The, the one sat within the other, and uh, there was also um, a, a mercury solution 
that was involved in this. And, you know, there's the stories of the Mercury Vortex engines that allegedly the ancient Vimanas of India yeah, used to create yeah. anti-gravity. Well, when you look at Del Shal's drawings, there, and I've pointed this out in a couple of my books and in my, my speech I gave at Bastrop, which you can find online, I pointed out, visually, you look at this, one of them's even bell-shaped that was on one of these flying machines in the 1850s. And the description of, for instance, what Joseph Farrell and, and Igor Wachowski and everyone who's you know, presented bell research and theory, the, the description, it's there. The, the exact way that they say that the bell worked, it's there, and it's there in drawings done between 1890 to 1923 when Del Shaw died. So, you know, on the one hand, people say, well, no, the Nazis, if the bell existed, it originated with the Nazis. Well, the Nazis got it from somewhere because Del Shaw shows in his illustrations multiple times this exact bell technology in a rudimentary fashion, and he died in 1923 before the real rise of the Nazis, okay? So that's why I argue that they got it probably from the NIMSA, because the NIMSA was the organization that had kind of backed the Sonora Aero Club initially. It's the Sonora Aero Club that Del Shaw shows this bell technology on these devices, uh, and and NIMSA was a German organization. Um, the the math is pretty easy here um, when you you know if you look at it um, huh. that the Nazis, in my opinion, are a product of this mysterious or the influence and resources of this mysterious NIMSA organization that Del Shell wrote about. Which makes you even think about the war a little bit differently and Project pa- Project uh, Paperclip a little bit differently. I mean, it kind of it kind of seems to to put some stuff together there. Was there a lot, was there a lot of sightings back in the 18, 1850 to 1890s besides the airship sightings of the late 1800s? Like, was there other sightings that corresponded to this as well? Do you think? Not a whole lot. And this is why I say that it was in the, uh, project development phase that they were probably testing on a very small scale. I lay out the hypothesis that um, one of the things that they were doing was going, um, using the uh, forts, the army forts, you know, west of the Mississippi, um, you know, um, to, to construct, to develop, um, you know, this technology because they were out there in the middle of nowhere. They were out there on the plains. Um, what you, what would be interesting, and I haven't done this to the full extent yet, would be to see, you know, how many available reports there are of what you're saying. You know, we're, we're people seeing this on the plains. Um, you know, asking the Native American, the descendants of the, you know, Native Americans that were out there at that time, you know, do they in their oral tradition or even in their uh, you know, written records, you know, do they have people that were, you know, seeing these things that wouldn't have got reported in the, you know, the newspapers of the day, for example, it would have been kept within the tribe. Um, so that's why I say that, you know, it's probably witnesses like that whose stories never, you know, hit the public ears or eyes, um, you know, and uh, that it was also being developed and it wasn't developed enough into something that was really going to be noticed or they, you know, wanted to test over cities until the 1890s. Yeah. Yeah. And then was there, was there a gap after 1903 and before the 1930s? I I feel like there was, there was a sort of something missing there between those, those decades or what do you, if, if, this is why I say that the um, the group that I call the 1903, um, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, I suggest a political, a, a, a political and philosophical reason. They just really, they truly broke away. They just did not want to get involved with stuff that was going on in our world. Um, I suggest that perhaps they saw the way things were going to go in the 20th century and decided, no, thank you. You know, we, we don't want any part of this. And they were just off. And, and it was cynicism driving that, you know, um, you know to heck with it. And because in my view, um, the, you know, NIMSA, they were hand in hand with globalism. OK. And it was really the globalists driving the world wars, for example. OK, we've. We've had a lot of analysis and research on that, and it's, you know, the New World Order slash globalists, 
um, you know, and their their byproducts, Marxism, socialism, communism, uh, neoconism, you know, in our times, you know, the, the that version of it. Um, you know, they're the ones who were making these world wars happen. They're the ones who were, you know, doing all these nefarious globalist things. And um, so I would say that that one stayed here in, when I say stayed here, they stayed very much involved in our world as we know it, because it served their aims to do so. So it's split, it's almost like it's split off then. The, the NIMS are kind of, the 1903 group split off, and then the technology also stayed with the maybe the the globalists well, well, in a no, way the they, they came out with not would been, would not have been affiliated with NIMSA. The break from NIMSA, uh, if you the thread that I see, the break that um, led to the 1903 that began with the Sonora Aero Club when Peter Menace and the other guys said no. Oh right, the okay, Prussian yeah. Rep- yeah. NIMSA and and you know Menace was killed and the members of the club disappeared. Okay, and it it. It was independent of NIMSA dating back to then, the late 1850s, in my opinion. So it was um, it was its own thing from the day, uh, by the time Solomon Andrews demonstrated his Aeron to Lincoln's war cabinet. When you described the propulsion, it kind of made me picture in my head the little device that Ed Lee Scallon was using at Coral Castle to move those big... Uh fucking coral boulders around have you ever has, has that ever come up or do you think there's any sort of crossover between that and and uh some of these mega well, sites yeah. Here, here, yeah it's interesting you bring that up here's the crossover um i think the uh you know the so-called popularly called the world grid you know within the tesla parlance um you know or the telluric current that uh, runs through the planet. I think that this energy has um, a lot to do with those airships and how they operated, uh, particularly the 1890s version. And I lay that out in my books, um, my Empire of the Wheel 2 Friends from Sonora book, and then I think I also talk about it again in Origin. I think that they would sail this telluric current like you would an ocean stream. Okay, um, the, I, I think these these uh, airships um, somehow tapped into this, and uh, you know it would follow um, these these telluric current lines. Now, how this ties in ties into Leedskalman is, yeah, I think he was also using the telluric um, energy of the earth for a different purpose. Um, similarly, you know, he, he was theoretically rendering these stones kind of weightless or buoyant so that one, you know, he could move them easily. It's yeah, it's the same idea, but for different purposes. So yeah, I think, um, they were tapping into the same thing. So that would probably go back right back to the ancient Egyptians and, and, you know, wherever else these things are getting built, Puma Punku, um, you know, yeah, wherever ones. else that it's possible that it was done, it was done. Sure, the, again, what what we're saying is this was um, very probably some type of ancient knowledge that you know it was either getting passed down or rediscovered by different people as time went on. You know, Leeds Galman being one, Tesla being another. Um, sure, yeah. So, so then I guess that kind of fills in that gap. So after after that the 1903 thing and the NIMSA continued on, let's say to, to develop over the next couple of decades, the Nazi bell, which kind of ended up becoming a, our more modern contemporary flying saucer. Uh, yeah, but there, there's a problem with that whole Nazi flying saucer story. There's little to zero, mostly zero provenance. When we're talking about that Hanabu thing that you have people writing about and insisting was real, um, actually, uh, you know, what they base that insistence on is, you know, um, a lot of nothing. So it, 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 there might not have actually been a Nazi flying saucer, you know, as such. Um, and what I see is that the Nazis were definitely influenced and to some degree provided, you know, certain resources from this NIMSA group, um, you know, to do their own. Oh, is that us? No, no, it can't be. Can it? 
All right, so sorry about that. People were back. We're reconnected again here. Uh, where were we? Someone Walt- really doesn't want us talking to Walter <laughs> tonight, it would seem. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yes, indeed. So, so where we were at was, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the NIMS influence. I, you know, I'm a big picture guy because it keeps it simple to, you know, you know, because you can always dig into the details yourself. Um, big picture here is the way I see it is this NIMS organization is really the that powerful unseen hand behind globalism. Okay. Oh. That's the way I see it. And uh, the other guys, the group I call the 1903, I think they're opposed to globalism. And I think that they're just rivals. They're natural rivals. And um, that's that's how I see it. You know, I present the details in my books and in my talks. But, you know, basically, that's the way I see it. Um, and, and, and I see the globalist side of it as bad. I am not a globalist. I am a staunch anti-globalist. I'm pro individual um i am not a collectivist so is that is that is that split carried on to this day yeah i'll see uh, what we were talking i think we were talking about earlier i think it was us talking about earlier um i think that these it's very possible this is my hypothesis again okay um going way out on a limb here i think that what you had in our last presidential election for example was NIMS on one side and the 1903 on the other. And that goes back to, you know, a guy named Trump who was a member of the Sonora Aero Club of the 1850s. No way. Really? Yeah. Mm. That's in Del Shao's art. That's not something that somebody faked just last week. That's something that was, you know, in Del Shao's material, and he died in 1923. So, you know... Huh. It's 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 very interesting. And uh, Donald Trump's uncle John was the engineer, the scientist who the U.S. government, I believe specifically the FBI, asked to go review the secret papers of Nikola Tesla that were found in his safe after he died. Okay, that was Donald Trump's uncle. This has been printed in uh, you know real. Um, sources out there and and this john trump donald's uncle came back and said you know publicly we're told he said there's nothing actionable here meaning in the technology you know immediately okay but remember this was 1943 middle of the war we don't know that that's what he really said we don't know that you know he didn't find something that they didn't try to make work with some military application think of the philadelphia experiment you know that was going on around you know that period you know before was right that, after tesla died was all that, that the stuff. invisibility one so, pardon was it philadelphia the invisibility one yeah that alleged invisibility experiment so you know maybe Maybe whatever the truth is about the Philadelphia experiment has its roots in what John Trump found in Tesla's papers. But here you have John Trump, out of all the engineers in America, you know, available, they go to John Trump. Now, is this because they knew about his connection to this breakaway? That, you know, um, that a relative of his had been in this Sonora Aero Club and maybe the, you know, remember I told you these guys disappeared after they broke up, after Peter Menace, you know, supposedly died. We don't know exactly what happened to them. For all we know, this Trump that was in the Sonora Aero Club might have been working with Solomon Andrews, might have been working with that post-Civil War black project that I say resulted in the 1890s airship mystery, okay? There might have been a Trump involved in the 1890s airship mystery and, you know, into the 20th century. There might be a Trump, have been a Trump in in this, you know, point of breakaway around 1903. And if there was, if all this is true, then, you know, somebody in the government and the national security structure would have known it and they would have known John Trump's familial connection to this, and maybe even more than just familial connection, no, and maybe that's why they asked him to review Tesla's papers. It's very, very interesting. And if all that big wild-ass speculation has any merit to it at all, now, 
think of what happened in 2016. You had the Bush political dynasty and their power um, pretty much, you know, their little weenies shrank, you know, during this election. You know, Jeb looked like a boob and the, the Bushes just kind of, you know, uh, you know, apparently couldn't do anything to Trump. Then you had the Clinton and their dynasty, you know, look, look, you know, how nutty he made her look and all them and they made themselves look too. But they couldn't stop Trump. Maybe, and this is wild ass speculation, folks. This is hypothesis. We're going really out there. Maybe whoever this 1903 actually is, maybe they're the ones who were ultimately backing up Trump. That's why I think it ties into disclosure because Hillary was out there trying to be open about UFOs and it seemed pretty forced to me about the whole Podesta thing and, and Hillary and this, you know, all these disclosure advocates betting that this is going to be the time when it happens and they lose Trump gets in and who knows, you know, what part of the, oh, the UFO mystery him and that whole side knows or wants people to know about. And then the globalists like through the TTSA and all that push their little, their little disclosure move out. That's why I think it's all connected to that as well. Cause they're like, well, now that they don't have control and they're not in that power, then they they want to push. And I, I, I mean, I don't, I have no idea why or what that would even mean, but it feels to me like there's a reason behind that. And like you said, it's perception management, I guess, or maybe it's putting the other side on their heels, you know, like for, forcing them, forcing the play a bit. Yeah. I, first of all, I, I, uh, my view is when ET disclo- is disclosed, um, he's going to disclose himself. I, I think the reason the, that we haven't had the you know disclosure, so to speak, is because the ETs are driving that. I think they're the ones that have said you will not disclose. Now that said, um, th- therefore, whatever. Um, I really don't have any faith that Hillary would have been a disclosure president. I mean, all the disclosure uh, preachers talking that gospel. How many presidents now have they just assured us was the disclosure president? They've stood up there and at conferences and on radio shows and in books. So and so is the disclosure president, and they never turn out to be. So I, I had zero faith that Hillary and Podesta and them were serious about that at all. Um, if anything, they were setting up, um, prepping whatever their perception management game was going to be um should they get in um, yep. i i have no faith that they would have been um disclosing anything so uh you know it, it just it depends on you know you got to look at the different perspectives here and you got to take into account that you know maybe what people are seeing and i've said this elsewhere you know in my opinion 90 percent of it 90 percent of it is more likely um secret space program technology or just classified basic military technology it's not alien it's not ET. Stuff, and man. this this so-called lack of disclosure really isn't that it's just to protect this technology yeah, or the or the disclosure is happening more of a people's disclosure, and the you know if there are ETs out there and they are commun, maybe they are communicating with all these groups of people all over the place. I mean that seems to be ramping up as well. I mean there are different organization of groups all over the place, and then you get the stuff that happens at the East SETI Ranch. I just met a guy; he's going to come on the show, and I mean the amount of experiences that they're having at that ranch is is incredible. I'm not saying it's all ET; it might be, you know, who knows who knows what else. I mean, where you draw the line between spirit and ET and, and maybe some kind of other black technology. I mean, MK ultra stuff, who knows, but you know, that could be going on in the background as well. Them just avoiding the whole power complex and going right to the people. Uh, that, that could, that could very well be. Of Yeah. yeah. Uh, I lean more towards the, probably reveal themselves to individuals um, when, when, when it starts to become a group, that's when time again, time and again, you know, repeatedly it falls apart. You find out that, you know, no, they, you know, the, either the, the group is faking it or they've been led astray by, you know, some type of their leader or whatever. <laughs> so I tend to not trust groups, you know, um, but certainly, yeah, I, I do think they they approach and reveal themselves to individuals. Uh, I do think that. Hmm. You yeah. think that's happening a lot? 
uh, you know, uh, uh, that's a relative term. I mean, look how many people there are in the world. You know, I think it's happened to enough people that, you know, some people could say, wow, that's happened a lot. But then, you know, maybe when you look at the big picture, you know, maybe in that regard, it's not really happening technically a lot. I think it has to do with the um, the uh, the development of the individual's you know, full existence. I, I think it has to do with, you know, the maturity level of their um, of their psyche. Um, I, I I tend to get somewhat have become, I should say, somewhat Jungian with uh, with this whole thing. Um, so you know, we, we've we've gone into the purple murky area here, and uh, that. I think is why we don't have a big disclosure, you know, in, in front of the whole world is because the phenomenon, the phenomenon itself is primarily one, uh, an individual phenomenon. It's an, an individual experience. And um, for whatever reason, the experience, I think, convinces most of the real experiencers to keep it to themselves. There's something that they're experiencing and learning you know, in this, that they realize, I don't have to share this. Anybody can have this experience, so I don't have to share mine. And I think that is how we're going to get disclosure. It's going to be more people are just, you know, we're going to reach that point where everybody kind of looks at each other and goes, oh, yeah, because they've all individually been convinced. I, I don't see, you know, it necessarily having to be, um, the press conference, you know, on on the news one night. I, I, although something like that will come, you know, should a civilization just come here and land here and say we don't care that you know we exist, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not the guy with all the answers. Yeah, I mean, some cultures are way ahead of us in North America here as far as accepting the reality of other civilizations out there possibly visiting us. I mean, it's, it, it, and, but I do sort of agree with you. We talk about that being like sort of the church of experience here a little bit. It's people having their own experiences and starting to slowly share them with less ridicule and shame around it now. And that's maybe going to reach a tipping point at some point, like you're talking about. You know, it could be really funny is when the, uh, just the regular old average extraterrestrials, the first ones that do get here, um, you know, they get here and they'll be greeted with all these people that have been, you know, kind of almost mystical about all this stuff going on that we've been saying is UFOs and ETs. And it'll be funny if they kind of hear this and they go, oh, well, that, that wasn't us. We have no idea who, you know, those beings are. We're just from this planet or this star out here. We're... <laughs> Yeah, we're just here to do business with you and, you know, a little diplomacy. And, yeah, yeah, we're here, but we have no idea what you're talking about we're with all these weird experiences you've been having, right? Yeah, we're not, we're not part <laughs> that, of the that intergalactic. Could be funny if it happened. Yeah, we're not part of the intergalactic federation. We're just here to trade. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're here to trade. And, and you know what? I think that's going to be um, uh, uh, really the, what it's going to, um, what it could really just end up being when we do make that, that, classic what we call contact we're here to trade or we're here you know to make war you know that the, the other thing that gets me is this this benevolent space brother stuff this idiotic childish notion that you know any civilization that achieves you know a technological level to where they can travel between the stars must have conquered their you know their bellicose self and they're peaceful what a crock I, I i mean you know that is some of the that is wishful thinking based on fairy tales um you know all that is is people who want to replace traditional religion with you know some new belief faith and hope system because you know, um, look how many, uh, you know, technological advances have been, you know, for the purpose of having weapons and war machines and stuff. So, and I don't think those ETs out there are any morally um, or ethically superior or much different from us. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I mean, historically with humans, it's conquer trade or sometimes, you know, the odd little bit of discovery that turns out to be conquering disguised as discovery yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know I, I, it's yeah i don't i don't put any special um uh, space angel uh, veneer on these et guys you know we'll, we'll we'll find out when we meet them i do a little bit i do yeah. yeah yeah i'm looking for the good you ones put that veneer on everyone you're, yeah. like, <laughs> you're starting the commune after the armageddon it'll be farming zombies <laughs> 
So what was it like for you leaving the FBI after all those years being in the gov- working for the government? I was, I was only in the FBI for six years and I went into the air force. And um, then I was, you know, I was a special agent OSI for the Air Force, and um, I was with the Air Force almost six years. And then I went in, to, I went to work for someone else doing counterterrorism for about the same period of time. So, so do you get called to shill lots then with your with your background? I mean, is that is that part uh, of know, what they what they uh, use against uh, you? Occasionally, that actually hasn't happened as much. You know, openly that I'm aware of uh, to my face, um, as you might think, and that's because you know I think people can tell you know I'm sincere and, and honest about my interest in these things, and you know I'm one of you guys. I just happen to have you know had this uh, this career, um, but uh, uh, one thing I do is I don't. I do not mislead people on what I was and what I did and what I know because of that work. I, I, I'm 100% honest. You know, I, like I said, I, I was in program protection. It doesn't mean I was read into every little um, operation that they were using, you know, this technology program in. Um, you know, um, I, I was this, I wasn't that. Is, I, and I like to be very clear on, uh, on those things. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah, and, and, and acknowledging that just because you're in some of those positions, that doesn't mean you know everything that's going on, that secrecy yeah, can, yeah, be, the, can be kept. It does. That, what, what cracks me up, but one of the things that cracks me up is, you know, I was talking earlier about what could be launched from Vandenberg without the public knowing it, without even, you know, the, the, the basic Air Force personnel knowing it. And occasionally you run into the, you know, the know-it-all um, who says, well, my uncle, you know, he worked. Annenberg launch site, and he doesn't, you know, think any of that went, he'll say none of that went on, and, and then when you ask them, you find out, you know, their uncle was uh, Staff Sergeant so-and-so, and he had nothing to do with anything to do with the payload on that rocket, you know, um, so, you know, Sergeant Uncle doesn't know crap anyway, and that's kind of my point, is things are compartmentalized. You know, you might be you might be the guy who's part of, you know, the, the process of launching that rocket, but that doesn't mean you have a need to know what's inside that rocket. Um, so, uh, you know, there you go. Um, it's, it's actually easier to keep things secret than people like to think. Now, everybody in their cynicism, you know, this... this this uh, uh, alleged conventional wisdom, and that's in quote marks, I'm saying, um, that, uh, you know, oh, the government can't keep secrets. So, okay, BS. Yes, they can. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff going on that's classified that, you, that we don't know about that we ain't ever going to find out about. What happens is usually when things screw up or fail, you know, that tends to lead to finding out about it. But there's, you know, when something is successful, you know, chances are it's going to stay classified. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, to, and when you see it, it's right before you get vaporized. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and, you know, and contrary to what some people might think, there is no 50 year rule in the United States like there is in England. Okay. Things do not have to automatically become declassified after X number of years. Um, if you look at the regulation, the U.S. law that covers classification process, something can remain classified forever as long as a class, the, the proper classification authority um, deems it necessary, they can keep it classified forever and ever. Um, and here's the other interesting thing. These contractors, that a lot of them are private corporations, okay, any secrets they have regarding technology or information, that belongs to a private entity, not the government, okay? Um, that's proprietary information. They are not obligated under U.S. law to reveal these secrets to the public. They, there is no obligation, you know, for them to reveal that. That's why I argued years ago that any the, the, the evidence, any material evidence, um, of UFOs or crashes or anything. I think years ago they learned, hey, let's shovel this stuff over to a private company that will, you know, uh, uh, be the custodians of this because we can have culpable deniability. Oh, we don't have crash flying saucers, not at all. We don't know what you're talking about. But this private company over here that's the custodian for such things, they never have to reveal that to the public. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah. That came a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> So what are you working on now, Walter? What's next? 
Are you kind of sticking uh, sticking with secret I space? Am, and... It's interesting. After spending a few days with uh, my friend Joseph Farrell and and kind of throwing at him the things I was looking at um, regarding a possible new book, um, my very interesting discussions with him helped me uh, uh, help me uh, bring bring the focus in tighter. And I, I I am working on officially now working on my next book. Um, it, what it what I discovered, I'll give you this little tidbit. What I discovered was there's a, a particular thread. Um, there's two threads, but there's a particular thread that I find an allusion to um, or, or direct discussion about um, across uh, in 33 chapters across all nine of my nonfiction books. And I thought, wow, I've written a book about Disneyland. I've written a book about occult serial murder and weird intrigues, you know, in the Empire of the Will trilogy. I, you know, I, I've, I've written uh, this Secret Missions trilogy about explorers and lost technology. And, you know, this book about my dad and Roswell and UFO recovery and the book Origin about breakaways. All these, you know, kind of diverse books. And yet, in all of them, in 33 chapters across these nine books, th this thread has turned up big time. So what the new book is about is I'm addressing that. I'm going to pull that thread and discuss, you know, how it ties all my uh, books so far together and why. And uh, so I'm really excited about it. I'm energized. The 33 just has to make me wonder if you're a shill again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret. Hey, you know, here's the thing. If I were, if I were a shill, I think I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be making some money for that. And trust me, <laughs> I'm probably more strapped than you guys. So, any any plans to work with Joseph at all in the, in the future? I mean, I'd love to. I, it would really be good if we could see you guys, you know, chatting up somewhere at a conference or here on a show or <laughs> something. Yeah. Hey, I'll just uh, just a little hint. Um, I'm not going to dis disclose any more at this point, but I am uh, talking with another uh, breakaway um, researcher about making a, um, a a small SSP conference happen, and that's all I'll say right for now. Um, when we got it more solidified and ready to announce, I'll come on and tell you all about it. And uh, of course. I think Joseph would be, will be in, invited to be among the speakers. Um, he and I developed a concept a few years ago for a collaboration, just kind of a really short pamphlet type book, which um, as soon as both our schedules permit, we're going to put out. It would be our first collaboration. Um, and, uh, so, and it has to do with breakaway civilization themes. Um, nice. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. that's uh, we got going there that sounds great yeah you'll have to let us know if either of those if and when either of those happen because we'll uh we'll definitely you know shout it out and put a link to it and all that kind of stuff absolutely is there anything else you want to mention before we wrap this thing up no uh just uh i have my uh various sites the the probably the number one that i should recommend to people is the walter bosley channel at youtube it's called that the walter bosley channel and that's where you know you can see my current commentary on things. Um, my books are available print on demand only at lulu.com, l u l u dot com, um, and I have empire of the wheel dot blogspot dot com, which I go on there occasionally and put essays, and there's some good ones already archived for you know anyone who hasn't been there. And I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and. Um, you know, where you'll see me talk about other things. I'm not all breakaway SSP all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's about it for now. Right on. All those links are in the show notes. And we really appreciate you, you know, hashing it out over this secret space program stuff. I mean, it was something we've been wanting to talk about for a while. So thanks for wetting for our whistle on that. putting up with all the bullshit. Yeah, it took us a few tries. Hey, you know, it's on my end, you know, we don't know. So we'll see. We'll see. All we'll right. see if you have any trouble when you go to post it. Yeah, Hopefully exactly. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks a lot, Walter. Stay safe out there. Thank you, guys. Okay. Take I, care. I look forward to the next. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that was our chat with uh, Mr. Walter Bosley. Bosley, it was a tough one to get through. Uh, we weren't joking when we were talking about the audio problems. I think we went through about 55 minutes of trying Skype, trying Zoom, trying a bunch of different things. And a lot of weird stuff happening. I mean, we normally. 
we had we had the DAW recording crash halfway through. Luckily, I noticed it right away. I had to start up a second recording. I'll have to splice them together after. Darren's going to find the, do some editing. Oh, fuck. And we re and we redid my to redo our intro. Yeah, yeah. So not the intro intro, but the intro with Walter. But yeah, that's fascinating stuff. What do you think about all that old Sonoric Flying Club and the? The Nims and going back to like 1850s. That's and that crazy that there's another the, little Trump tie there after the fucking, because the Tesla one was crazy enough, you know? Oh, that's what I was going to mention. Like say, coming out of Tesla's papers and saying there's nothing here. I mean, come on. That's just a fucking <laughs> yeah, red flag. Yeah. After all the Tesla's <laughs> developed. Ah, there's nothing here. Yeah, it's all good. I'll just <laughs> keep that for yeah. the 1903 club. Yeah. It's my shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I enjoyed yeah. it. Big thanks to for Walter. To Walter for coming on the show. Uh, he must have given up at the end, I think, of over three hours of his time with all the fucking hoo-ha, hoo-ha, hee-ha. So, yeah, obviously we hit on something in this episode that somebody didn't want us talking about. Um, Can't believe you're the one going down that route. Which route? The conspiratorial route. Yeah, well, you know, you guys have got to head over to grimerica.ca slash support. And keep us uh, independently funded so we don't have the shut-off problems that we were talking about during the show with all these other guys. Uh, as long as you guys are supporting us, theoretically, they can't shut us off. So let's keep that going. Let's keep that growing. Grimerica.ca slash support, guys. There's there's literally about 30 or 40 different options to support the show. Patreon, uh, cryptocurrencies, PayPal, you name it. There's subscriptions anywhere from a dollar a month to anything north of that so if you guys can do that that'd be great we really appreciate it it does help it does help us keep the wheels on this thing and keep everything ad free sponsor free paywall free and you get the black budget which we are working still on streamlining and uh, i think we're going to start getting a little more uh, regular content in there hopefully with maybe some interviews with some past guests we've got some fun shows with our moms that we just dropped in there so check it all out guys it's fun stuff Spam gram. Yep. And you been getting any Instagram, spam? Instagram. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of spam, yeah. Instagram gram. Instagram gram. And listen to the true foe show, motherfuckers. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Somehow I built a rocket ship. Out of the stuff dreams are made and popsicle sticks Please look at my rocket ship schematics Tell me you can fly to the moon, tell me I'm not a lunatic In my hands I have a gas can and matchsticks Yes sir, this is my home but I need a vacation From all the sadness, the chaos and traumatics I'll let you do the countdown, 3, 2, 1, no hesitation
you supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 Send us your blood. Donate to Grand America. It'll feel real good. Donate to Grand America. All will be right with the world. Donate to Grand America. It'll feel real good. Donate to Grand America. All will be right with the universe. We could just start harvesting blood from our listeners and selling it. <laughs> We're going to have to expand the yeah. bit. That's a way to support the show. Just send us your blood. That's a way to support the show. Just send us your blood. That's a way to support the show. Just send us your blood. 